All right, guys, glad you are here. I just want to say welcome to all of our brothers in Uganda. And I have uh, just one important announcement that y'all are going to need to write down, put it in your phone, or something that doesn't pertain to our Uganda guys. But uh, well, yeah, we got a So uh, I have double booked myself for something that I can't get out of. So this is kind of on me. So on December 7th, that'll be two weeks from now, we are not going to have class. So December 7th, two weeks from now, we're not going to have class. The next week on the 14th, we were going to have a lab and question answer time. I'm going to teach that class on that day. So we won't miss it. Uh, and I've decided with Sylvester and Ronnie to do more of lab stuff on the side where it can be just us. So uh, December 7th, no class, okay? And if you can, uh, Gil, if you'll let some of the other bikers who are, come sometimes to know, yeah. and those guys usually come in late anyway, we may see them tonight, but I just want to <laughs> make sure that uh, if somebody shows up here, it wasn't because I did not let you know. And I do apologize, that was on me, but every now and then that happens. This is why Brother Tim uh, Randolph told us don't have two calendars. Make sure everything goes on the calendar. <laughs> don't pledge something until you've looked at your calendar and it happens every now and then. Do we have any prayer requests? We'll continue to pray for uh, Brother Ronnie. He's got some personal issues why he's not here. He has not dropped out of the church planting center, though. He's still going to plant in New Braunfels and then Gina and Larry. Church planters for Unashamed Biker Church are still recovering. Yeah, and Brother Chris is having a hard time. He's going to have to relocate, move uh, from where he's living. So uh, that's a tough Maybe situation, good. too. So Maybe a good thing. But, uh, Any of y'all got a garage or a doghouse? I mean, somewhere <laughs> that he could stay. The doghouse is fine. I've been in a tent for three months. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I'm used to being in the doghouse, yeah. but... What other prayer yeah, requests do. do we have? <laughs> Any other prayer requests? All right, well, let's pray for these things. I have one more introduction after this, and then we'll get started. Lord, it is good to be in your presence tonight. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for uh, just this uh, training center and what you're doing in and through these guys. Uh, I thank you so much for Brother Randy. Uh, as he has dedicated himself for tonight to teach us uh, from his knowledge and from his experience and Lord I just pray everyone will open their hearts open their minds to the teaching and Lord I do pray uh, continually for uh, Larry and Gina Robert and uh, Lord I just pray that you continue to use them through Unashamed Biker Church we pray for brother Ronnie Garrett and his family as they are uh, just going through a hard time right now uh, we do look forward to him being back in the church bank center and uh, just pray that you just keep your hand on him and bring him complete healing. And uh, Lord, it's just good to be in your presence tonight. We just pray uh, that everyone will focus on what you're going to bring us tonight. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. One more introduction. Uh, Brother Peter Coe is visiting here from Wisconsin. Uh, Brother Tom uh, has taken him to some churches. He spoke this weekend. Uh, he has partnered with one of our local churches, uh, Fellowship Baptist Church, right, yes. in Morgan's Point. Uh, Jeremy Franks uh, actually taught one of our classes, our very first class on demographics, is the pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church. They have partnered with Livingstone uh, Korean Baptist Church in Madison, Wisconsin, and we have made trips. I have been to Brother <clears throat> Peter's church, and uh, so we have been up there to see what God is doing in and through them. And now he has come uh, here to visit with uh, Fellowship Baptist Church and, and to and go to the annual meeting uh, for the, uh, the BGCT in Galveston this past weekend. Yeah. Uh, him and Tom made a fast and furious trip <laughs> down there. And so it's good to have uh, one of our partners, one of our planters. Uh, he's doing an incredible work around uh, the university. And there's a hospital too, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but mainly university, so uh, a fairly large Korean population there. He is uh, actually doing the same thing I'm doing, meeting in a sister church uh, and reaching out to 
his target group. So we're glad that Brother Peter Coe is here with us tonight. He just wanted to come see that we were legit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Brother Randy Evans is going to uh, be our instructor tonight. He'll give you a short biography on himself, and then the rest of the time is his. Uh, thanks, Carl. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, once again, I had this privilege of bringing these same lessons a few times so yeah. over the years, and so appreciate Carl asking me to, to come back. Uh, I, you know, I always want to say, well, if you can find somebody to do better, you know, just have them do it. Uh, I don't know if that means he can't find anybody, period. And so he, I'm, I'm the one down still. But no, it's because he's done a good enough job. Yeah. Says, hey. <laughs> uh, I was pastor at the First Baptist Church in Holland for 14 years, uh, 2005, uh, 2019. Since 2000, uh, September 2019 to today, I'm uh, working in the business world. I manage a a headstone sales company uh, out of uh, Waco. It's a just a branch location for our home office, which is in, in Hamilton. Um, but uh, really enjoying it. You know, still get to work with people, still get to help serve uh, folks, and you know that's what leadership really is all about: is uh, serving others and serving them well. And so I'm learning a lot of lessons about uh, how to serve people in a different way than in, in the church. It's uh, I grew up in the church uh, and spent you know, all my life. I don't, I don't remember not being in church. And so uh, I know how to work with church people. And I know how to serve them and serve alongside them. But this is different to, to work in a you know, secular, if you want to use that term, uh, setting and working with people who uh, you know, have varying beliefs and all of them in some kind of level of grief, I guess, if they're coming in to purchase a headstone. So uh, it's been a, a great experience. I've really enjoyed doing that. Uh, for, for now, that's what I'm going to continue doing. Uh, I have had the opportunity to, to preach on occasion for folks who are out, and I appreciate that. I, I preached down in a little church, very little church, in, uh, near Elgin, about uh, an hour from from here, uh, McDade Baptist Church, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and now I'm going back this Sunday, and they've asked me to be their interim. So, wow. uh, we'll see. I haven't I haven't committed to that yet, but uh, it's another another day of the week that I drive an hour. But uh, you know, if the Lord opens the door, then I, I think. Uh, How probably, long did you pastor before? Huh? Uh, it's good. Good. I was a pastor at a church out in West Texas, uh, near uh, north of Abilene, a little town called Rotan there six years and served two years and on the mission field in Venezuela with my wife and um, as volunteer missionaries and then uh, started the ministry in the youth youth ministry a uh, little church in Abilene so uh, been in ministry for, for a long time and, and uh, you know I don't know what the Lord has for us in the, in the future so uh, we'll see maybe back in full-time ministry at some point who knows uh, so that's a little bit about me. I've got uh, my wife uh, and I've been married uh, in January will be 29 years and we have four kids. Uh, our oldest is our daughter and she's uh, 25. Yeah, she just turned 25 and our oldest son uh, is 22 and uh, we have twin boys that are uh, 19, both in college, uh, school, one that Texas State Technical College over in Waco uh, studying plumbing and another one is in Texas State University, uh, studying history and wanting to be a, a, a coach and, and teacher in the high school uh, level. And um, then we have one grandson who's five going on 25, <laughs> something like that. So yeah, he's, he's great. We look forward to seeing him on Thanksgiving. But, uh, so thank you for the opportunity to, to be here uh, with you tonight. Uh, Subject that we're going to cover is not, you know, one of the most thrilling subjects in church life and administration, uh, the basics of church administration. And, uh, but it's an, it's an important uh, aspect of the, of the life of a church, whether it's a new church start or an existing church, um, doesn't matter. It's, it's important. Uh, when I first started in ministry, I started, as I said, 
in youth ministry uh, in 1993 or 1992, really, um, uh, at a little church, North Park Baptist Church in Abilene, and my pastor was Lewis Johnson. Uh, he's still there. He's actually retiring. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's a little church, about 75, 80, never been any bigger than that. Uh, been smaller than that, but never bigger than that. And he's been there for well over 30 years. Uh, very faithful. Uh, wonderful uh, teacher, uh, pastor, and uh, administrator. Really is. And, and he sat me down one one day. He, we, we met uh, each week, and he would talk, and, and I would listen. Uh, I didn't know anything. So uh, he, he knew it all. And uh, he's one of the best preachers, best teachers I've ever uh, been under. Great friend and a mentor in ministry, you know, just committed all of these years to that, that small congregation um, and so thankful for, for his impact on my life. But on one of those occasions, I was 22 years old and he sat me down and, and he handed me an article uh, from a, an old magazine uh, called uh, Church Leadership Magazine that he had received years earlier. So who knows what, when this thing was actually published, but uh, the title of the, the article was called to minister and forced to administer. So yeah. called to minister, minister and forced to administer. And, and the, the focus of the article really was, uh, you know, the tension that ministers face when they feel called to the ministry. Uh, you know, they have this idea of what ministry looks like. But then there's also this, this idea of somebody's got to be running the show. You know, somebody's got to be in charge of all of the, the, the matters of administration, whether they're big or small, doesn't matter. Uh, somebody has to be watching over all of those. And most of the time in the church, those duties fall to the pastor to be the, you know, lead administrator over all the uh, aspects, whether it's financial or uh, personnel or uh, physical uh, resources that the church has, as well as the people, you know, so... Uh, lots of lots of areas when we talk about administration. We're going to talk just some specifics, nuts and bolts type uh, administration tonight. But <clears throat> there really are lots of areas to minister, you know, uh, within the, the congregation. So uh, one of the one of my professors uh, who taught uh, intro to Christian ministry in in uh, when when I was a probably a sophomore in, in college at Harvey Simmons University and uh, I don't like can I say Harvey Simmons on on mm -hmm. Mary Harden Baylor campus I think so. <laughs> All right, <good>. okay uh, <clears throat> yeah go Cowboys um, but anyway uh, Dr. Shields was my professor and he used as his textbook for one of our classes uh, Franklin Siegler's book A Theology of Church and Ministry it's ancient and Dr. Siegler was a professor at Southwestern University for, for a lot of years, but um, it's, it's a great just basic introduction to what, what church and ministry should look like or what it, what it did look like, at least in his time. But he said this about administration in the church. He said, organizations are living and powerful <clears throat> only when the persons involved in the organizations give life through their thoughts and energies. Organized groups achieve in proportion to the effectiveness of their leadership. The church is no exception. As a human institution, it stands in need of leadership. Its spiritual objectives demand clarification and enunciation, and its mission depends upon organization, planning, and guidance. Church administration is necessary, then, for the accomplishment of the church's ministry. So, basically, he says you can't really accomplish ministry in a church without being having that uh, administering component to it, administration component. So he says it involves more than methods and techniques. It's more than a series of mechanical procedures. Its aims are spiritual and its methods must comply with its primary purposes. And he says the idea that certain functions of the pastor's ministry are spiritual and the administration is less than spiritual is a false concept. So, you know, a lot of times as people who feel called into ministry, we, we do have this ideal, ideal picture of what ministry is. It's all about preaching and teaching and working with people and seeing the transformation that occurs in, in their lives. And that's, and that is true. And that, that is the exciting part of, of ministry. But then there's also this administration piece that is not so exciting, but it's also 
as important. And there's not any difference in the two. There's not one's not more spiritually important than the other when you talk about the church. Welcome, guys. Sorry. No, you're, you're fine. Uh, <clears throat> so administration should be seen as vital and meaningful in the spiritual life of the church, just as much as preaching, teaching, baptizing, uh, sharing the gospel, those kinds of things. So they all work together. Um, another book that I used uh, in, the, in my education, early education in college, uh, Charles Tidwell's uh, book, Church Administration. He says, church administration is the leadership which equips the church to be the church and to do the work of the church. So church administration is the leadership which equips the church to be the church and to do the church, to the work of the church. So it's providing guidance, it's uh, helping to shepherd the resources of the church, whether they're spiritual resources, human resources, physical resources, financial resources, and helping to move them toward you know, a goal, a purpose, achieving the purpose of the church. So uh, the church is given resources by God. And uh, we all know that in a church or most churches anyway that I've been a part of, resources are limited. Limited people, limited finances, maybe the physical structure of the, of the facility is limited uh, from a human perspective. Uh, since we're given those resources by God to use, then, then we are... Uh, to use them well to be to be good stewards of whatever resources he has for us. So um, that's kind of a, just an overview of what church administration is. The fact that it is just as important spiritually uh, as the other aspects of ministry that we tend to elevate: preaching, teaching, um, pastoring, those kinds of things. So administration. Administration has been one of my gifts. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know where it came from. You know, it, it's just God. Uh, that's why I make a good manager of the office that I run currently. Because I, and I was thinking about this just uh, the other day. I said, you know, I, I'm uh, a good manager. You know, I'm, I'm just a good manager. That's why I am thriving in the position I'm in. Because that's what they've asked me to do: to take these resources, to shepherd them in such a way that produces a, a good result and so um and there's nothing wrong with it you know there are some folks who are good managers or some that are not um, and, and every pastor has a different set of gifts um i, I get so i live in holland but i work in waco so i spend about an hour each, each way going to work and coming home from work uh, so I get to spend a lot of time listening to sermons, uh, podcasts. I get to listen to a lot of uh, leadership podcasts. And, uh, and it's been really helpful for me to, to think about, to listen to, and, and consider uh, some different perspectives. And I don't remember one of the resources that I was listening to recently, but they just talked about the different aspects and the ways that pastors are gifted. You know, some some... Carl is gifted evangelist. There, there's no doubt about that. He's a gifted evangelist. He knows how to share the gospel with people at every walk of life, every stage in, in life. He, he, if you need to know about evangelism, he's the man to go to. Others are, are visionaries. You know, pastors that, that just they just know how to cast a, a vision for the for the church as an overall. Okay, this is where we this is where we're headed, and we're going to lead the way, and this is where we're going. Um, you know, there's others that are, that are good at uh, gifted at discipleship of, of shepherding people, of helping them grow in their faith and, and learn. And then there's others of us, you know, that are good at administrating. And so that means, you know, managing the resources that, that we have. We have a purpose, we have a goal, but we're not maybe the best at, at casting that vision. May not we, we're good at we can do evangelism, but that may not be our our strongest gift. And there's nothing wrong with with any of that, you know, we tend to think of a pastor being, well, you've got to be the best evangelist in the world, or you've got to be the best visionary in the world, or you've got to be the best preacher or the best teacher, whatever it is, the best disciple maker. But it takes all different kinds. And, you know, the churches that we serve, whether we're starting at the church or whether we're serving in a, in a established church, 
you know, God puts the person in leadership for that moment. You know, for the 14 years that I was at First Baptist Holland, you know, we we saw a lot of change, a lot of growth. We built a building. Uh, we, yeah, million dollar building over 10 years. Now we didn't and we didn't borrow money, and we we did a lot of the work ourselves. Uh, we, you know, started from from nothing to to what it is, you know, building wise today. And they needed somebody. You know, now I can look back on it. They needed somebody who had a steady hand, somebody who, you know, I'm a bus driver. I, I drive a school bus every morning and I, I love it. And I said, <coughs> I'm the kind of guy that, that you want driving your kids to school. Because I'm not, I'm not like this. You know, I don't show up some days and just be all on the top of things and all down here and, and distracted or whatever. I, I'm just this guy. And so you want that guy behind the wheel of your kid's school bus because you don't want somebody I mean, I, I've known some school bus drivers who I didn't want my kids on their bus because they, they're more worried about what the kids are doing back there than what's going on in the front in front of them. And so all of that to say, you know, there's just we're all different. And and I hope I guess do you all do some spiritual gift assessments here and some leadership assessments and those kinds of things. You know, those are valuable to help you to realize, okay, this is who I am. And there's that's who God made us to be. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, yeah, we need to grow in certain areas, but we also need to be strong in, in the areas and, and then look for those churches that need that that kind of person. So we know, teach we teach to staff to your weakness. Ah. Focus on your strength. Right. And staff to your weakness. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, that, that's really good. I like that. Um, so, you know, don't be ashamed of where you are. Yes, grow, but there's also, you know, God's going to put you in a place where he can use your gifts and your skills. And that, that's what I saw over those 14 years. Uh, you know, missions is one of my passions. I love people to be involved in missions. And that's what we, that's what we did for 14 years. We just, Every way we could be involved in missions, we were involved in missions, giving to missions, going, serving. And so we're far afield from where we started with the church administration, but it, it goes back to the fact that, that we have a, a purpose. God places us in, in churches or allows us to start churches where he can use us and our skills the best. And so uh, I hope that what I can share with you tonight about church administration will help you whether you're good at it, uh, whether you've never done it before, whether that's a you know a growth area for you, that maybe be some practical things that we can that I can share with you from from my skills uh, to be able to, to encourage you along your way. So, uh, as we think about church administration, um, where in the scripture might you look? Let's just say the New Testament because we're talking about church administration. Church is established in the New Testament. Where would you look for some? some guiding passages um, in the New Testament for the church. All right, Acts. Any specific spot in the Acts? I think that's a good one. I mean, that's where, you know, you, you learn. We're, I'm just finishing up the book of Acts in my morning reading. I just finished it this morning. We've got a lot of stuff in there. What's that, brother? Yeah, especially in Romans chapter 12, you know, to the end of the, end, end of the, the book. That's the more practical section, but definitely the theology there in, in the first 11 chapters, for sure. What else? Some specifics. Give me some specifics. Pastors. Timothy's instructions. Okay. On, on church leadership. And right. Staffing and yep. The deacons. Uh, past. First and second Timothy. Uh, you know, those are Paul's pastoral epistles. Titus. Uh, you know, he's, he's instructing young pastors on how to, to deal with problems and situations in the church, as well as uh, how to organize and sustain the church. That's good. Others? I think Ephesians 4, where it says, mm. in some he gave sure. uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers yeah. for the equipping of the saints for the work of service for the building of the body. Yeah. yeah, Ephesians chapter 4, that's, that's one of the best. For me, it's Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, everybody, we're going to go with you there. Acts chapter 6. 
you'll know it just as soon as I start reading it. Like we return it. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter six. So, verse beginning in verse one is in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Mm -hmm. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, "It would not be right for us to neglect the minister of the word of God in order to wait, wait on tables." Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the church was founded. Jesus founded the church. We know Acts chapter uh, 3, where the, the Holy Spirit comes and empowers the church. But here, here we are, just three chapters in, you know, just a brief time into the church, and there's already a problem. Uh, <laughs> Not surprising, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> they're human, and and anytime you get a bunch of humans together, they're going to be they're going to be problems because people uh, people just they see they notice when there's issues going on. So in this particular instance, you've got uh, apparently there was a they were trying to be a blessing. They were just uh, distributing food, staple items to widows. In this newly founded community of believers, <clears throat> but some of those uh, widows, specifically the Greek-speaking Jewish widows, were being overlooked. Now they probably weren't purposely neglected; they weren't doing it on purpose. Uh, but the system was just too small to handle the large demand, and the people they they started to complain. Those ladies started com to complain. Uh, being good Baptists, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the Hebrew speaking Jewish widows, they saw, hey, they're being taken care of, but the Greek speaking Jewish widows are not being taken care of. And we want to know what's going on and what's going to be done about the situation. And so they began to, to, to question that. And, and, and they probably weren't being overlooked because of their ethnicity. There's not a racial tension idea here uh, necessarily, but the problem. Some are being ministered to, some are not being ministered to. So, so they, they decided they're going to solve the problem. And, and the best way to solve the problem is they, this again proves they were Baptists. They had a business. They, made it yeah. they, 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 they said, all right, let's get together. Let's talk about this. And, that be, and so in the business meeting, that leadership committee presents a report to the congregation, which includes a recommendation to create and appoint another committee of seven men who would take responsibility of serving the Hellenistic Jewish widows, the Greek speaking Jewish widows. This day, distribution of bread. Uh, that is a great example yeah. of church administration. Yes. See the problem, <clears throat> recommend a solution, and implement a plan. Mm -hmm. That's that's church administration in, in a nutshell. Because in any church, you're going to have problems. You're going to have issues. You're going to have people who say, "Well, what about this issue over here? What about what about these people? Or what about?" Why can't we be doing this? Or why isn't it being done this way? Okay, well, and, and people are good at seeing the problem. Mm -hmm. But leadership comes in and administration comes in by saying, okay, here's the problem. Now, let's formulate a plan and let's, let, let's implement it. Probably and a good old testament would be Jethro, oh, yeah. Jethro yep. saying, Moses, you're going to wear yourself out. And literally, right. Implemented multi layers of administration. Sure. I mean, it's not church. But... Well, but it is a group of people uh, gathered. To, yeah, that's a good example of Moses, his father in law, Jethro, you know, helping him. Yeah. You can't do it all. You know, you're going to need some help and, and laying, layering that out as far as giving over some of that. So, and the great thing about this story in the book of Acts is the result of the ministry of administration was reported in verse 7, so the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, 
and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So, so once the ministry of administration took place, things started working better. Mm -hmm. People started taking notice. People weren't complaining. Now they're out sharing that, hey, this, this group of uh, people takes care of their widows, takes care of those who are less fortunate. You know, so, and even some of the priests and the, you know, city began to take notice and say, hey, these guys have something going on that, that's different than what we have. They became obedient to the faith too. So Paul gives another example uh, in Titus. Uh, he was left there. The Titus was left on the island of Crete to appoint elders among the congregation. In 1 Timothy, Paul writes about the qualifications of overseers and deacons. We mentioned that. Uh, Romans 12, and also it's kind of partner. 1 Corinthians 12 compares uh, the church with the human body, each part kind of playing a unique role and, and functioning within the organization. And in each of those uh, positions that, that Paul mentions, uh, they are specific. They provide the proper ordering and efficient uh, administration of the church. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 and 28. It says, together you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of that body. In the church, God has given a place first to apostles, second to prophets, third to teachers. Then God has given a place to those who do miracles, those who have gifts of healing, those who can help others, those who are able to govern administration, and those who can speak in different languages. So, so he says it takes all of these people, all of these roles to, to, to have a, a smooth functioning church. And there's got to be somebody kind of at the top helping those people to know where the state function best and, and those kinds of things. So uh, this evening, as we move through our time together and share some insights with you that I hope will be helpful uh, with issues that we addressed at First Baptist Church in Holland uh, through my 14 years, I've brought a few other resources to share with you, uh, mostly our copies from those things that we use in, in at Holland, and and um, so we're going to start with just um, the very basic. I think the the subject is is church administration, uh, conducting business meetings, and and budgets, something like that. Financial planning. Financial planning. Um, so let's just. I'm going to start with conducting business meetings because that's kind of the easiest thing to take, take, take it first, and then we'll move into the financial piece of it. But uh, how many of you grew up in the church or have spent a number of years in the church? All right. How many of you grew up in churches that had business meetings? All right. Um, how many of you go to churches now that have business meetings? Okay. Right. Uh, they changed through the years. Uh, I've only passed for two churches uh, in the 20 years of, of pastoral ministry, but I've been in lots of business meetings in the 51 years of my life. Uh, like I said, I never remember time not being involved in the church. And I've been to a lot of business meetings. Uh, when I was went to pastor my first church at Crossroads Baptist Church outside of Rotan, I'd never led a business meeting before. So what did I, what did, I do? I just thought, well, uh, what, did brother, what did Brother Lewis do? When I was at North Park, what did he say? How did he start things? Um, what did Brother Bethay Fielding do? You know, in my church that I went to as a teenager. What did Brother Leon Green do when I was a kid at Calvary Baptist Church in Hobson, Mexico? And so I just kind of, all right, well, and I've been to all these other meetings. I've been to annual meetings. I've been to associational meetings. I, I've been to lots of business meetings. And so I just did what I had heard and and saw and and what was modeled for me in the years past and so um i probably didn't do it all right and whoever the robert is that created the rules if he showed up he probably would just begin to weep you know uh, because it wasn't right but um i believe most of us if not all of us could be called upon at any moment's notice to say would you lead the, the business meeting and you could pretty much come up with with what you need to do so so if you were to be called upon just your pastor's suddenly violently ill, can't lead the meeting, and he says, I need you to, to step up and lead this meeting, what, what would you start with? Prayer. All right, good. <laughs> now, I always started my business. Right. Well, I got to where at First Baptist Hall, we always had a meal before we had yeah. a business meeting. The reason we did that is because Baptists, when they're full, 
don't like to fight. It really worked out well. Uh, and so we would always have a meal and then about everybody's kind of starting their dessert. I would step up and say, all right, let, you know, we're going to be, you know, usually I would say, well, let's, I need a motion to call, you know, be called right. in order or whatever and that, that you don't need to do that. You just say, I, I'm going to, you know, we're going to be in session at this moment. You know, I'm calling this all the order here and we're, we're beginning the business meeting and I would always start with scripture reading, some scripture, uh, whether it was related to the church or from the Psalms and then prayer. Definitely always start with prayer. So call to order and then, and then here's the real reason we're here, scripture reading, prayer. And then, and then where might you go after that? Yes, it's approving the minutes. Okay, you got to got to prove the minutes from the previous meeting. So, uh, you know, I've been in meetings where the meeting some minutes had to be read. Yep. And man, you know, you had to sit there and listen to them read yep. all about what you were, you know. And some churches, you know, have a meeting every month, right? And so, yet we were just here two three weeks ago, and now we're listening to it all over again. Who was there? And who wasn't there? And what was said? When I got to Holland, I, I asked the very first meeting, I asked the church clerk, who was also my ministry assistant, to read the minutes. And she said, absolutely not. If you, want, if you want them read, you can read. I said, well, folks, hope you've had a lot of time to read those minutes while we're here. Uh, I'm here to take a motion that we approve those as printed. So I never, we never read a minute. And, you know, I mean, people are, they're sitting there looking at them. They've already read through them 10 times. And you know, they might have a correction of meeting, so they and most of them were there. That's right. They 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 know they so all right. So you got call to order, scripture, prayer, uh approval of minutes. Where might you go from there? Budget meeting all right, finance report. That's it's usually you know, that's what everybody's there for anyway. Yep. So how are we doing? Bottom line, you know, we're we better off than we were a month ago. Um so you know. I always threw in, if we have any, uh, in the Baptist world, uh, any letters to grant, you know, somebody yeah. moved to a new church and they've requested their letter of recommendation. Yeah. And so we would we'd vote on that. Then we'd move to the financial report. And then from there, it's just, you know, new business or committee reports. Right? You got an old business. Yeah. Got to have old business. Oh, yes. Don't you dare pass this. Yeah. You got to have old business. Any old business? Any old business? <laughs> Well, that's what's brought up in the minutes. Yeah. That's why you have the minutes from the previous yeah, meeting. Yeah, well, what did we ever, did anybody ever buy a lawnmower? Yeah. 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 Okay. We got things. We got a new lawnmower. Uh, it's all taken care of. Larry is going to be the one pushing the lawnmower, you know, whatever. Then, then it is the new business. Uh, Pastor Lewis Johnson, he always, and I think this is a wise idea. I never implemented it. I probably should have. And, and maybe in the next time I will. Yeah. <clears throat> but at North Park Baptist Church, if you wanted to speak and during the new business moment in the business meeting, two weeks in advance, you had to present that. Mm -hmm. And it had to be on the written agenda, okay. which was published in the church bulletin a week in advance. So everybody knew what was going to be talked about. Right. Okay. So that kept, oh gosh, how many of you have ever been in the meeting? Yeah. Well, Brother Pastor, I think we ought to, you know, put up a church bell. That's like doing an open. Oh, it's inviting lots of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most of the time, people are, you know, if they've eaten, they're glad to be you there. That. What, what but there's somebody. I call for a vote of no confidence. And, oh, you could. Oh. You could do that. Really? It, it really could happen. That's right. I've seen it. <laughs> and so I think hey, Brother Lewis had a good idea. You know, hey, you have to bring it I to us that. in advance. We will publish it in the bulletin, like and that. then, therefore, when we get to that new business section, we all know what's going to be taking place. Like that. That's the way you always handle it. I think that's good. So, uh, you know, after new business, you know, no new business, and I entertain a motion to adjourn. There's always, you know, ten people wanting to, to give that motion. So, uh, and then, then you move on. Uh, some just some practical things. So that that's kind of a, an outline. I've got one here, and you can take it with you if you want. Uh, that I always use, uh, but we just walk through it. <clears throat> you got to decide how often you're going to meet. Now, that's one of the practical ideas. Uh, most of the time, your church bylaws mm -hmm. um, or constitution and bylaws will tell you when and how often you're supposed to meet. 
Um, when I came to First Holland, they met monthly on the second Sunday of the month. We eventually moved to just meeting once a quarter. We didn't need to meet, you know, once a month. Just those monthly meetings were over in 10 minutes. You know, we had the presentation of the minutes. We talked about the financial report, and then there was typically no new business, whole business, and we're out. Uh, so once a quarter, there was a little bit more to, to deal with, and, and uh, even those meetings didn't last more than about 15 or 20 if, if there was nothing, if nobody stood up and said, hey, you know, I don't, I don't like faster. Um, so when, when are you going to meet? Uh, how often are you going to meet? What, are you gonna, what is the church going to consider during those meetings? You know, every church has a different personality. Um, churches that I grew up in and the first church that I pastored, they wanted to vote on everything. If a dollar was going to be spent, it had to be brought before the church and approved. And uh, if it wasn't, they were upset. And, uh, you know, that's just that was just the nature of those churches. So so you would spend a lot of time. Well, I think we need to get five dollars, you know, to, to so and so because he's down on his luck or whatever. And you have to vote on it. Um, when I came to Holland, they had at one time been a church that voted on everything. But they had all these committees, and, I, and, and in, as I was reading through, that's one of the things I did very early on. I read through the church yeah. documents, and it said, hey, every committee has the authority to spend up to $500 without, as long as it's in the budget, and as long as it's in the bank. I mean, there's two different things there, right? Um, <laughs> then they can spend $500 without any church approval. And I said, well, then we don't need to vote on whether the evangelism committee can spend $100 to buy some tracts. We don't have to vote on that. And so I just started, that was the, the process. If a committee if a committee could handle it, then they could handle it. If it was more than $500, they had to come to the church, bring a recommendation. The church had to you know, vote on that recommendation. Uh, that, that smoothed things out a lot, took, took a lot of that stuff that just popped up in business meetings out of the way too. Uh, so determine what you're gonna consider, uh, determine to follow the church's bylaws, that's, you know, uh, the bylaws are there to keep you out of court. And so and the, the closer you can follow the bylaws, the better you are. Uh, just because if there's ever an issue, then, then you say, well, this is what our governing documents say. And uh, this, is what, this is why we did it this way. And, you know, the court then doesn't have anything to say. When you say church, is that like a generic term or is... You mean everybody in the church? As far as <clears throat> whoever is present, whoever that's a generic term. So whoever's present for the business meeting, and and, every, and your bylaws will be will dictate that as well. Okay. You know how many people do you have to have together to be able to act on, right. you know, vote on business. Right. And so when, yeah, when I say the church voted on it. The 10 people who show up for business meetings, they're the ones who get to decide because they show up. That's a good question. Or if you're the only the only catch to it is, is that if you put in your bylaws that you have to have uh 40% or some whatever number you put in there, and you only have 20% of the people show up to your meeting, then you've kind of trapped yourself into not being able to vote because you the last church I was in the core. Yeah, yeah core. That's what right. core. Yeah. The last church I was in, basically because we had a couple of times where we didn't have enough people, according to the bylaws, to vote. And they said, then we're going to start saying, if if we're having a business meeting and you're not there, tough. If it's something to be voted on and you don't come, we're dropping the quorum. Whoever's there is going to vote and we're going to do it. And they made that decision, not me, <laughs> but we put it in the bylaws. Well, and that's what our bylaws said. Those present. Present. Get to vote. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. members, members, they have to be members of the church. Yeah. <laughs> Not just anybody. Could sh <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah, see uh, you know, it's a go so and so off the street and vote for this. It's just a thought. One of the things I found helpful to change the bylaws, you cannot vote unless you have attended half the worship services. Uh, oh, wow. In the previous okay. court, because you always have, you know, the ringers come in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We yeah. did that in. That was it, along with forget the quorum stuff, you know, you show up, that's the quorum. But that did a tremendous amount to, to eliminate a lot of hassle. That actually, that that's actually, actually yeah. I think we both have seen this one where, where 
we have a very controversial boat coming. If it's in that matter, sure, we've it. all seen it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know that so-and-so who just showed up to vote yeah. hasn't been stepping foot in that church yeah. for about 20 years, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden they and all sure. 17 others of their family members mm -hmm. are there to vote on that one. How about uh, is that is how do you get around that one? Because if you do that, whoever's right. here, that's, that's the only like way you, you get around. It has, around. it has to be in the business, it has to be in the Bible. That's, that's all where it's also one of the importance of it talks about a covenant. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and then yeah. going from if you have an attendee and participate, you move into an inactive mm -hmm. member status. Yeah, that's not yeah, that's that's active good. member status. So there are many ways to get around, right? But it has to be, it has to be dictated. The other thing I have to deal with. Myself personally, was I was given a five thousand dollar Christmas bonus for wow. buying music from a, a family that passed away, and they were musicians and gave a church. Now my budget rolled over January first, <laughs> so I was then told that I would lose all five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah if you didn't spend it first. Boy, did I have a wonderful Christmas! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was buying. I don't know what. Music. It didn't I mean, matter. All the music in the world. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. I would just buy it. We'll never just, use it. Yeah. You never use it. Just sat in the library. And just, you know. Yeah, that's a good but one. But you got to be careful of that because that's in the Bible. It is. It will roll over. Yeah. Any money left in your account will roll over. Right. If somebody does that, it's. Well, I've seen, yeah. I've seen what you're talking about two times. One, I'm sure I attended as a as a child, like my parents grew up there, were married, uh, or my dad grew up in that church. Uh, they were, my mom and dad were married in that church. And very small, about 30 people. And uh, they had a bivocational pastor, and we loved him. He was a very good uh, family friend of ours. And uh, had a youth minister come in. We hired the church, hired this youth minister. And I loved the youth minister, his wife. They were bivocational also, um, and uh, was very close to them. But, but they decided that they were going to take over the church. And uh, so they did this kind of vote of no confidence type thing. And they brought in, I mean, they went, you know, down the streets and got people who were in their 80s and 90s who couldn't physically come every Sunday and brought them in and said, you need to vote for me because I'm, I'm going to be your pastor. And they, and they, they did. They, they ousted the old pastor, got him in, and it was destroyed the church and destroyed my family. It was just heart-wrenching for my family, you know. Um, so that, that was the worst that I've ever seen that. I've seen it in another instance um, where we were deciding when we were going to have our services, what time it was going to be. And, and uh, so we had the deacon say, well, we just need to vote on it. We just need to vote on it. Okay. So we, we put it out there and we say, these are the two options. Keep it the way it is or, or change it. I walk into the auditorium that Sunday morning. I saw people that I hadn't seen in six months to a year all of their kids were there i said oh i know which way we're going to be voting today and if i could have changed that one thing i could have changed one thing that day when we voted on it because it affected everybody who attended not just members of the church right yeah. i would have said yeah we're going to vote on it but it's going to be whoever comes if you are here because i had i had a whole family who were not church attenders regularly, but they had been coming because we had our service early and they liked it. Right. I'm talking grandmother, grandfather, and about six kids, and none of them were Christians. But they came every Sunday morning. Wow. And they voted, we voted to change service to a later time, and they said, wow. they never came back. Wow. And I said, you know, if those six people had voted, and about 10 or 15 others that were not members of the church who came regularly, it either would have been tied or it would have stayed the same. Right. Now, all those people, you know, those people who came that hadn't been there in a year and voted, they didn't care. Yeah. yeah. But they had friends who cared yeah. and they wanted it to go a certain way. And it went that way. Yeah. And, you know, I said, hey, I'm going to be here whatever time you tell me to be here, whatever time church is, because I, I, you know, I, I have to, you know, what I mean, I'm the pastor. So, you know, that, that's a minor issue. The other was a major issue, but I've seen it, you know, where they just go drag people in, you know. So putting it in the bylaws, stating who can be the quorum. I like your idea of active covenant. Are you active member? You know, if you haven't been active in the last six months, you don't get a voice. You don't get a voice. 
Okay. We also put an age limit too. Right. We, we did on the children. We did on certain things. Um, if it involved going into debt, dismissing a staff yeah, member. Whatever it was, 18 and above an active member. Wow. Right. And that's of all the chunk. Yeah. Yeah. That's, nice. that, that's, that's you know, we did for certain <clears throat> really important stuff, but if they were just voting on the nominating committee report, I didn't care if the six year old church member voted yes or no. You know. <laughs> Uh, and, and they loved it, you know, and the teenagers love, you know, 13 year old right. teenagers like to be able to vote on something, you know, right. so, but, but it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And, and maybe, maybe that's a better. It just works for several churches. Now. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of the packing out. You know. Correct. Yeah. You, yeah. You couldn't drag your kids there and say, this is how you're going to vote. Uh, good. Any questions on business meetings? I mean, you know, we could go all night on business meetings. It's, it's very easy to conduct one. It's not necessarily easy to, to live with the results of one. Well, I'll make a move, a motion that we move past the business. Meeting. Okay, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say, have a second. Yeah, yeah, all in favor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just, um, right. we need to have a conversation <laughs> first before we. Move. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead. One of the things, and you've mentioned this, I've done it at my churches. I think there's maybe some thought of what you name the business meeting. Because mm -hmm. the business meeting seems to be well, the corporation sure. and its leaders are meeting mm -hmm. it. We, we got to call them family gatherings. And the whole idea call. was hey, mm -hmm. this isn't a meeting of the corporation. Right. This is the family right. getting together to discuss, to discuss some family yeah. business yeah. and trying to kind of just change that attitude. That's good. So, and that's what we do right now. We just had one. And I told them this is a family meeting and we're going to discuss some future things. Huh. So that's what we call the family meeting. I like that. Okay. I know some churches call it church conference, but that's similar to that idea. I guess it's less corporate, but still a little more formal. So usually it's, uh, when, when is a good time for a business meeting? Sunday or other day? Right after church. So. Okay. Every church is different. Mm -hmm. um, I've been uh, live for the potluck. Yeah, I, we, we always had a meal, like I said, so we put in the evening on, on evening. Sunday evening. Okay. They come, eat, and they have the business meeting. But when I first uh, pastored in Holland, uh, it was always a Wednesday night That's mm -hmm. what we did. after church. Whew. And if you went, if you had a lot to deal with, you know, on the occasion that we did, it was a long night, you know, and so I never liked the Wednesday night after church. Um, I always like, you know, we would do some things on Sunday mornings if they were just really mm -hmm. vital, you know, certain like passing the budget was in our bylaws. It had to be a special meeting on Sunday morning at the end of the service. Um, if we would have a potluck after church on a Sunday morning, I'd have it at lunch. Sometimes I would put that business meeting there too, because we're already eating. It's time. It's our. It's time to have a meeting. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and do it all, and, and then we wouldn't come back on Sunday evening. You know. So the other case is that you know, uh, if we have you know membership and just the pre uh, presence at uh, service. Right. So we if we have a difference, that meeting is only member at the time. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, at worship worship times, maybe twenty is join. Correct. So in that case, is how can we handle this? I'm a little, yeah. If, if our church is this, this case. Um. I mean, I've seen it done a couple of ways. You know, one thing I've seen is just uh, when we would have to have a business meeting on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. At the end of our service, I would say, I would try to say, we understand if you're a guest with us, you may not want to stay. Right. 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 Feel free if you need to leave. Okay. We're going to have a family meeting. Mm -hmm. We're going to have this time of business. Okay. Um, we're going to take a break for about five minutes and then come back. And that just gives everybody a little bit of time. If, if those guests want to go ahead and leave, they can. But sometimes they want to stay, they want to know what's going on. Okay. And so then they have the opportunity. Oh yeah, look, we're just going to say, you know, the church is it's functioning good, right? And there's some wisdom to say, hey, we'd love to have you join us because mm -hmm. you know it takes away that scaredness. Of, Correct. Hey, this is a all those preconceived ideas of what the church is. 
No, this, this is a body of believers. And yeah. We see their love. Yeah. You don't want to make how they do business together, even when they disagree. <laughs> even when they disagree yeah. yeah, so so long as the church is functioning, the right? Is I think it's healthy for the church to see. Yeah, no, I do too. I mean, yeah, I've been is. I've been a visitor, you know, mm -hmm. on a Sunday. You know, now there have been times where I'm like, "Ooh, I wish they would have said, if you're a guest, you know, because I I would have left." I mean, you know, but you know, I mean, that happened just recently. I was visiting my mom and her church, and they were. You can vote on, I don't even remember now what they were voting on, but boy, I thought it was never going to be. It was right after service on the Sunday morning. I thought it was never going to be over. I was like, wrap this thing up and let's vote. I mean, you know, <laughs> or y'all need to vote and get this thing over with, whatever it was. It wasn't, wasn't anything major. They just wanted to talk about it, the color of the chairs or whatever. I just think the most important thing about conducting business meetings is that you do have it in your bylaws. And that your people, not not just your leadership, but your people understand. Uh, like one thing that we had was if you were gonna if you were gonna vote on something, that it had to be uh, printed out and put in the foyer at least one week before the vote to give people time you know, to think about it, to to look into it, pray about it, and think about it. But that was in the bylaws. So, uh, and if you were going to call a special call business meeting, that mm -hmm. was in the bylaws, and it had to be done at least a week, two weeks, like, and then two, two weeks, weeks and then two weeks. Yeah, it was two weeks for a special call. So, it just make sure that whatever you're going to do is in the bylaws, and then you follow them, and that'll also keep you as a pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, because if people say, "Why did you do that?" and you say, "Because you told me to," in the bylaws, you voted on. It. See what I'm saying? It protects you too. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's probably one of the most important things to me because I did what Randy did. When I went to a church, uh, the first thing that I did within the first week was read the bylaws and constitution so that I knew how they function. Well, the, how they were supposed to. Most of them, <laughs> right. Most of them they've never read them themselves. Right. Yes. You know. Well, but then if they ask you, why are you doing that? Correct. Then you can say, because it you, says right here. you said that's how it was done. Yeah. And if they say, oh, well, we don't do that anymore, then you can say, now we need to have a business meeting. Right. <laughs> you know, and we need to get change, this we need to change it. So. Yeah. You want your bylaws to, to line up with your, you want your bylaws to line up with your practice or exactly. vice versa. You want, your, you want your bylaws to reflect what you do. It, it's got to be the same. And uh, <laughs> it's not right or wrong. Right. It just needs to be the same so that right. there's not this, issue of well you know the bylaws say this but we're going to do this that's when you get yourself into it how often do you right. recommend revising uh five to seven years five to seven years yeah I don't know. so things change and i understand as yes is. and you try to keep them up to date as you go but there you need to take those yeah. big times to look over everything we like did that church you know we're using the same bylaws we used 70 years ago you know? correct well, I, when I got to Holland in 2005, I asked for, I said, well, I need a copy of the Constitution and bylaws. Well, um, I know we've got some. Uh, and they, I mean, they finally found them, but they had, they didn't know where they were. What they said, here's our bylaws. I look at the data on all of them. They just copied them from other church. Most of them are the same bylaws that, you know, these people had, or, you know, and it doesn't, line up so i guess in 2000 we did some kind of updating of the bylaws just in general um here we're just going to remove some things take add some things but then in 2000 and i don't know if we did it two times we did we did two major revisions while i was there for 14 years so we did one in like 2000 and uh seven and then a 2014 something like that when we took everything apart the first time boy it was grueling it took us a year right. to take it all apart put it all back it together does. again and, and add some things to it and then the 2007 revision was less extensive but we still went through everything and said we're not doing this anymore and now we are doing this we're adding taking away adding taking away and uh you know when i left i yeah, things were 
here's what we do currently. Now, whether they follow those now, I don't know. Probably and we're not. Gonna, we will have an entire class on good that deals with uh, constitutional bylaws, the legal parts of the constitution, right? And then your bylaws are basically how your church is going to function. Right. function. So we're going to have an entire class. On that. That's good. Yeah, it's it's vital. It's vital. It's vital. It's vital. Okay, so business meetings. Good. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about budgeting, uh, financial planning, and spending. I know that's a bad word, budgeting. Um, <laughs> I remember the first time I was scheduled to, to teach this session. Uh, I had went to breakfast with Tom Henderson, and uh, I just said, "Well, what what would you you know?" I asked him, "I said, what would you talk about? You know, if, if you were." The one presenting this course or this class, what would you talk about? He said, Well, I would, he said, I would talk first about personal spending, personal budget, personal finance. And then you can talk about the church. I was like, oh, interesting. So that's I said, Yeah, I think we should do that. Um, you know, so that's kind of the way we're gonna approach it because really they 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 go hand in hand. Um, and this is where as a manager, you type leader um you know god's really worked in my life I, I think i think a lot of my managing skills especially the financial budgeting part of church life has come out of my own you know um experience with money and, and our own my, our transformation in our family uh my wife and i especially so you know i, I think uh, far too pe many people in ministry they spend their lives um, knotted up on the inside because of their personal finances are a mess. Not just in ministry, people in general, but, mm -hmm. but especially ministers. Um, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, right? Um, and, and our families of origin can, they affect us in every area of our lives. Um, even, in, in, even in our spending, even in our Attitudes toward finances. I, I listen to one of my favorite podcasts is Dave Ramsey. I, I love listening to Dave Ramsey on, on podcast. And he's has his daughter now works with him, Rachel Cruz. And, and she talks about your money, uh, your money. Oh, she talked about the family of origin that you come from and, and how that affects the money. She's got some term for it. I'm trying to remember now what it is, but um, just the way you were raised around money affects how you look think about money as a as an adult uh, you know for years i was usually in a, in a couple you have one who's a spender and one who's a saver mm -hmm. uh, and i was the spender uh, when we got married 29 years ago almost 29 years ago my wife was a saver uh, but i grew up in a kind of a modest mid-class uh, middle-class family both my parents worked they had good jobs they were paid well um I never knew what it was like to be without what I needed. Um, it wasn't necessarily that I got everything I wanted, but I never lacked for what I needed. You know, I remember one of my earliest experiences with money. Anybody remember Gibson's department store? Anybody yeah, yeah. old enough to remember Gibson's? Okay, yeah. that's the, that's a precursor to Walmart. Yep. Uh, way precursor. And uh, I was in Gibson's department store with my mom, and I saw one of those. I was young. Yeah, I saw one of those electric, you know, kids now, they all have them, but, you know, they first came out when I was probably two, three, four years old, one of those electric cars or whatever. This was a police bike, actually, you know, but it was electric. I thought that was so cool. I don't remember how much it was, but it was probably a lot. And I asked mom, I said, well, that's, you know, I want that. And she's like, well, we don't, we don't have enough money for that, you know, whatever it was, whatever it cost. And I was like, well, you have a check. I mean, you know, just write the check, you know. Check. I saw what mom did, you know, she wrote the check. She she paid all the bills. I know you've got money. Just, just write the check. She's like, well, it doesn't work that way. You know, so that, that's one of my first early money memory. So I don't remember ever not having what I needed, not necessarily what I wanted. Didn't always get that. My wife, Julianne, grew up very different from me. Her dad was a carpenter, uh, worked for himself. Her mom was uh, stayed at home with the kids. Um, and uh, money was always tight, always tight. Uh, she never went without, but her family did not do the things that my family did. We went out to eat regularly, you know, every Friday night we went out to eat. 
they didn't their their big splurge was to go to Pizza Hut in town for mm -hmm. carry out. I mean, you know, that was like, whoa, we're you know, we're uptown, we're going to Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Christmas was the exception for them. Christmas, their parents saved lots of her parents saved lots of money and and spent lots of money on Christmas, a lot of it clothes and things that they would use throughout the year, but still, you know, that was kind of the time where they felt like they were just, you know, lavished upon. So um, things were just very practical, very, you know, tight. I remember going to eat at their house one of the first times we had hamburgers, real hamburgers. They raised their own beef, you know, which is great, but it's the first time I'd ever had, uh, I don't know what y'all call them. We, I grew up calling them uh, red beans, you know, just brown beans, pinto beans, whatever you want to call them. I don't know what y'all call them. We, we call them red beans. But they, they had red beans with their hamburgers. And then I'm like, oh, that's kind of different. You know, we'll go along with it, right? <laughs> well, then the next time I ate there, we may have, we had sandwiches, but we had a pot of beans. And then, and, and we might have lasagna, you know. <laughs> they had beans <laughs> with every meal. <laughs> Why? They were cheap. Yeah. And they filled you up. Yeah. And, you know, so when we first got married, I finally don't know I was like, I love beans, I do. So I don't want them anymore, you know. <laughs> we don't need to have them with every meal, you know. That's all she knew. You know, I'm like, how about a green bean? You know, that would be good. So anyway, uh, so she just had very different, you know, money styles. So we got married. I'm the spender. She's the saver. It didn't go so well. Our our idea of a budget was <clears throat> is the is the check register. Remember, you have your check registers. Nobody uses a check register anymore. <clears throat> you wrote checks then and you wrote them in your register to know and you kept your balance you know running when it got to zero that was the end of our budget yeah i mean you know we just we didn't know any different i had a 50 dollar a week church job i was a youth minister she had a job on campus working for one of the professors i don't know she didn't make very much either <clears throat> thankfully we had a parsonage that the church had a small house that we lived in and uh and my parents helped us out some too, which was a great thing. But you know, we just didn't know how to handle money, and we ended up spending every bit that we had, every little, all the little that we had, we spent. Then we decided, hey, we need to do something better. So we, there was a guy years ago, his name was Larry Burkett. He was kind of the very first financial speaker and author in Christian life. Um, and we got his book. We read it, How to Manage Your Money. That was really what it was called, How to Manage Your Money. And he even had a software program. So funny. Uh, I'm dating myself. I'm 51. Just had a birthday yesterday. And we had a computer and we, we loaded that software on the three and a half inch floppy. Well, they weren't floppy. They were hard yeah, to start, you know, horrible. It didn't work. I mean, it was just I never, I never understood how that software worked. Never did. So we just got a ledger and just tried to keep up with it. Yeah, that was a mess. Well, I finally got introduced to Dave Ramsey by one of my cousins. He wrote a book, his first book called Financial Peace. I uh, checked it out in the library, read it in about two days. And I said, this is, this is what we need to do. He's got a very simple plan. Uh, you know, he calls it uh, uh, the debt snowball. You know, the, he, calls, he calls them the baby steps. He's got seven baby steps. And the first one is, is when you're talking about getting your finances read, uh, together, you got you to save up $1,000. $1,000 emergency fund. He said, because if you can, if you have a thousand dollars in the bank, not going to touch unless there's an emergency, then then your budget won't get busted because there's always going to be something. And most emergencies that we have are less than a thousand dollars. So thousand dollar emergency fund, save that up as fast as you can. The second one, and really kind of along the same timeline, is is what he calls a zero based budget um, or a cash flow plan. Um, he, and I've got a copy of his. Uh, zero based budget up here that you can take home with you if you want it. Every dollar um, belongs to something. And giving every dollar a name but before the month starts. He says, spending your money on purpose before the month starts. So you know where your money's going rather than wondering where it went, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it, and that one, those two pieces, $1,000 and the zero based budget, revolutionized our lives. I, I became the one in charge of our finances at that point. My wife had always been the one to pay bills because she was 
she was the saver. She was the one who, you know, was working all, and she, she knew all of that stuff. She, she had done accounting and you don't have to have an accounting degree to do this. But I said, I can, I can do this. And so I started taking that away from her, which was causing her a lot of stress. And I love it. I still, I, to this day, I'm still one. I, every month, I spend all of our money in advance. Now, he's got a great online program called Every Dollar. It's called everydollar.com or .net, I don't remember, but you can just search Dave Ramsey Every Dollar. And, you know, I can copy last, you know, your budget is basically the same every month, ours is. So you, I just copy it from one month to the next and just change this, 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 this. Or we got a, we've got two kids in college, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're staying out of debt with that. And so how do we, we do that? We got to put more money here, less money there. And we just finesse it every month. And, you know, she says, hey, I'm, we're new, we, we really need, you know, uh, new towels in the bathroom or whatever. And, okay, well, let's put that in the budget. You know, we, we work it out where that'll work into our budget. We save for it over several months. Um, so every dollar, that, that's, that's a lifesaver. Um, but he has three, kind of the focus of the, of the every dollar budget is, is three areas. And, and we're gonna talk about these three areas in personal finance, but they're also gonna be in our discussion of church finance. And the first is planned giving. You know, you gotta plan your giving. So he's talking about spending your money on purpose every, before the month begins, you know, and when he say zero based budget, that just means you've got X number of dollars coming in for the month. And when you reach the bottom, you have zero. And you spend everything in between on purpose. You know what I have to have for a light bill, for uh, gas in the car, for uh, food on the table, you know, those kind of really important aspects of life, uh, house payments, whatever it is, taking care of home first, and then, you know, moving on. But, but he says, and in his zero base budget, the first line is, is giving, um, mm -hmm. planned giving, you know. And he says, of course, Dave Ramsey, he's a Christian, says, you know, uh, he tithes to his local church. Wouldn't you like to be his pastor? I mean, you know, 10% of his income is going to be a pretty big yeah, sum right. of money. Um, but so, you, you know, as ministers, I think you, have, you should be tithing, giving the mission offerings, other special offerings that your church is, is, is uh, taking up or, or receiving. Um, I believe God blesses you when you tithe. You know, some people say, well, we're, we're not in the Old Testament anymore. We don't have to tithe. Maybe so. But I do. I believe you know that was good for God's people in the Old Testament. Why not continue that in, in the uh, into the New Testament? And I think God blesses us when we set aside, when we're diligent to set aside that ten percent. And I always challenge my people in, in church to do that. I think you need to be tithing. I couldn't challenge them to tithe unless I was doing it myself. And so they didn't know what I gave. They, uh, I didn't publish my records or anything like that, like they do for you know, want the presidents to put their you know, tax returns out or whatever. Uh, but, I, you know, I believe God blesses us when we tithe. It may not be that we get more money in the mail, um, but it may be that the car doesn't break down, kids don't get sick. Um, um, and it may be that, that all those things do happen. But then the money is still there to, to meet all of those needs. So honoring God with the first 10% of what you make, I think has to be a priority for the, for the ministry. And you say, well, you really shouldn't even have to say that. That's true. But I've known, I've known plenty of pastors, plenty of ministers who struggle with, with tithing. As ministers, we don't make a lot of money. Uh, that's just long and short of it. Uh, wish it weren't that way, but it, it is. And so... Yeah, sometimes things are tight. Um, you know, lots, of, lots of my friends who struggle with credit card debt. You know, they just can't get out of that hole. Um, and so, therefore, tithing is a challenge as well. So, but I think once you make that commitment, then God's going to honor that. It may not be easy, but He's going to honor. It. So, um, so plan getting. That's got to be first. Plan spending. We already talked about that zero based budget giving every dollar a name, spending it, you know, in advance. Uh, Dave Ramsey's book, The Total Money Makeover, that's uh, kind of a follow-up to financial peace. Financial peace is really the biblical foundation of everything. So if you want a lot of scripture, a lot of help with that, financial peace is the book to read. Total Money Makeover, if you just kind of want the overall uh, idea of what he's talking about. 
Uh, same biblical principles, just not as much scripture printed in the book. Uh, the cash flow plan, the zero based budget, every dollar app, those kinds of things. You just can't go wrong. You know, I was introduced to Dave Ramsey probably around the age of 2000. So I was probably 32 years old. Um, Boy, if I'd known that when I was 22 years old, how much different things would have been in that 10 years, you know, how different things are when I'm now I'm 51 since I've been 30, since I was 32, you know, gosh, the sooner you get it, yeah, almost 20 years, yeah so. the sooner you get it, the better, you know, the more God just pours out his blessings on you again, not financially, but just once you get your house in order, and a lot of times the church and, and every other area of your life will go, go better. Um, he talks about, he, he has, so plan spending includes that zero-based budget. It includes uh, the debt snowball that he talks about if you have, if you have commercial debt, student loans, credit card debts, uh, personal loans, uh, you know, HELOCs, uh, home improvement loans, uh, line of credit, those kinds of things. Getting those start tackling those list them smallest to largest and then just doesn't matter what the percentage of the interest is or whatever it might be just tack, tackle that first smallest one and then he calls the snowball once you get that one out you take the money you were paying on that one you apply it to the next one and then so forth and then you just gain momentum as like a snowball rolling down the hill it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and you know i listen to dave ramsey's podcast every day uh, he always says <coughs> somebody uh, he calls them debt-free screams. They just come on and they, they tell the story about how they got out of debt. I mean, you know, some people, uh, you know, I feel good after. I'm like, man, uh, you know, we have we have our mortgage. That's all we have. That's all the debt we have. And uh, I can't wait till we get out of from underneath that. Uh, and I work every month. You know, that's why I drive my bus to try to help, you know, put a little bit more money on that, um, that mortgage. But, man, they come on there, you know, 300 Four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in debt from school loans, most of them, and they say, you know what? It took us nine years, wow. but we did, it. you know. Or it took us, you know. Of course, they're making, you know, they're some of them are doctors and lawyers and nurse anesthetists, and you know, they're making, you know, three times what I make, or what my wife and I make together in one year. They're making it by themselves in one year. That's great, you know. And they have they have a bigger shovel than I do to get out of debt, um, but. It, it works. So uh, we, when we started Dave Ramsey, we had a little car. We had a 1996 Saturn. Anybody remember the Saturn? Oh, yeah. I love those things. I love that Saturn. And uh, we, we, we came off the mission field. We didn't have a car. We sold both our cars after when we left to go to the mission field. Didn't have a car. We said, we got to have a car. We've got to have a car. Everybody's got to have a car. Got to have a car. We don't have any money to buy a car so let's borrow money to buy a car mm. so we did and uh so once we paid that off we never got we've never gone into debt for a car since then. just because we just said we're never going to do that again we're never going to do that again we made a commitment we're never going to do that again and so it works it works it works uh, we had other debts along with that car but but that was the biggest and then the others were smaller so we were able to take care of them pretty quickly but um you know, and I still save for a new car every month. It's a hundred dollars. I put a hundred dollars in an account every month for a new car. It's gonna take me a while. I mean, my car is gonna be worn out before I reach that point, but I'm hoping that you know, get those kids out of college, the car will last, and then we can put some more money into that fund, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, so personal finance, plan spending, plan giving, um, uh, plan. I want to leave one out. Plan giving, plan spending, and then plan saving. That's what I was talking about. Right. I was talking about the saving for my car. So that's personal finance. We're going to take a little break. Um, and we're going to apply those same principles to church budgeting here in just a, a minute. So let's take, uh, I don't know, what do you, what do you boom. All right, we're going to continue on uh, talking about church finances at this point. Um, you know, uh, Talking about personal finance, we're going to use those same uh, type of uh, categories, but we're going to kind of flesh it out a little bit differently. Um, 
just share a little bit about the situation that I found myself in when I came to First Baptist Hall in 2005 with regard to financial planning and spending uh, as a church. Church was on solid ground financially. There was no problem there. Uh, we had a volunteer who served as our treasurer in 2005, as most churches do. She was a dedicated church member, uh, mid to late 40s. Uh, but she really had no business being the treasurer. Um, she had... Uh, We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute, but our church had a counting committee, uh, two people who met and counted the receipts for the for each Sunday. Uh, they met every Monday morning, counted those things, gave everything to our church uh, ministry assistant, church secretary. She liked to be called uh, General Flunky. Um, <laughs> she, was, she was the one that would take the, the information, make the deposits, put it into our database, and give me the report. Um, and then give the report, obviously, to our, our treasurer as well. Um, and then uh, she would, uh, our treasurer would, would then, you know, pay all the bills and then and put the paychecks out there for us each, um, each month and then give a report at our, our monthly, at that time, business meeting. Um, but after about two years of watching the reports, I knew something needed to change. The reports that she gave, our treasurer gave every month, always contained what the people thought was an error of some sort. It didn't matter whether it was to our benefit or to our detriment. And they would ask, they would say, well, I don't really understand why we have this or this is here and why not? And, and so we, I would say, well, uh, treasurer, what, what can you get some explanation? She would, this was her line. I don't know. That's just what the computer said. <laughs> ah, okay. So um, I remember one particular report where our church's bank account had said we were in the red. We were, we were, you know, in the negative two thousand dollars at the end of the month. I didn't say anything. I just watched and I waited for what people might say, and no one questioned. Because they knew what the answer was. I don't know. That's just what the computer. <laughs> That's literally what she said every time. So they didn't even ask. And I was like, hmm, all right. Next time, next month, we come to the report. Now it says we we have like four thousand five hundred to the to the good. We're in the black. <laughs> uh, again, I just watched. I waited. No questions. I was like, okay, we've got to do something different. So our chance for change occurred when the volunteer decided. She needed to give up her position. It was just too stressful for her. I thanked her privately. I thanked her publicly for all that she had done because she's done it for many years. But inside, I was rejoicing. I was so thrilled that she's, that she's the one that made the decision because she was related to half the church. And I couldn't say to her, uh, you don't need to be the treasurer anymore. So she had to come to that decision. She did. I was praying about it for a long time. She got answered for it. I, I said, um, we need to hire someone to do this, and we need to hire someone outside the church. And so I called the association. And at the time, the association's treasurer was a man named Claude White. And great, great man, uh, wonderful treasurer. And I, and I actually called him. I said, Claude, I need somebody that will do a, an audit. We're changing treasurers. I need somebody to do an audit. And he said, well, I don't really know anybody that would do that. For you, but I know someone who might do your books, and she would kind of do an audit in taking over those books. Yeah. And her name is Mary Ann Dotson. I said, "Well, give me your number." So I gave she he gave me Mary Ann's number, and I called her, and, and she was kind of trained. She was starting a new business. She was a travel agent, um, but she also was doing this. She worked at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Temple. I guess she still does. She still does. Yeah. Um, and but she was kind of taking on other churches on the side and doing doing small churches helping them out and so i just called her and said hey well, this is who we are this is our situation would you be interested how much would it cost and she told us and i went to the church and we hired her. best single best decision we ever made in the 14 years that i was the pastor literally that was number one best decision so that was 2007 uh, by so she started in October 2007. By December 2007, she had every 
mess untangled and could see what was really happening. You know, taxes weren't being paid on time. We had all kinds of penalties. Um, you know, just we were basically living. So we were paying this month's bills on next month's money. So whatever we were receiving out here was paying for last month's bills. And you, you can't continue that way. Because if you have a bad month out here, you don't have enough money to cover last month's bills plus this month's bills. So by December 2007, she said, you have five, you have basically $500 left in your bank account. So this is mid-December. We don't have enough money to make payroll. Because when payroll was at the end of the month. We paid on the 28th of the month. She said, you don't have enough money. I like to be paid. I don't know about you, but I like to be paid. So I went to the deacons and I said, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I said, this is the finance report. We have $500 left in our in our bank account. What, what do we need to do? Of course, we prayed together. Um, but they said, let's just, let's just tell the church. Let's just tell them what the situation really is. Uh, write a letter and just put it out there. And so I did. I wrote the letter. And I, this is what this is so what I said. I said, I've enclosed a copy of September's and October's financial statements. September was a good month, but you'll notice that October's deficit was severe. So we apparently had a bad month in October 2007. Although our November financial reports are not complete, it looks like we ended the money with a deficit of $1,435.99. It's disconcerting when our general fund balance drops below $500, which it did this month. I know this is a bad time of year to talk to people about money, but as the deacons and I discussed the situation, we felt you would want to be informed. We're not begging for money, but we would like to ask everyone to prayerfully consider your current level of giving. And remember, we're never more like God than when we are giving. So our folks responded, you know, it was amazing. Uh, by giving December 2007, $17,591.71. Single best months offering. From that, from that day, church of 2007 would have been about 120 something years old. And they've never had that much come in in one month. And God just flipped it, just mm -hmm. flipped it. So, you know, we were able to meet payroll, we could give Christmas uh, bonuses that we normally give, all of that kind of stuff, and start the year in a good position. And I really do, and I always, and I told her 10 years later, we celebrated Marianne in October of 2017 and her, her assistant, Sarah, uh, we had them come, we, we gave them a plaque. I mean, we would just, they, they say, they, they helped us salvage our church because putting our finances in order, God began to pour out the blessing. This is all while we're building the church, raising money to, to build it as we, as we went. So, um, <clears throat> So I say all of that not to, to say, wow, you know, uh, God will give you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars if you hire Mary Ann. Um, but <clears throat> he will bless you in lots of ways if you get your finances in order, whether that's personal, we've already talked about that, or as a church. One of the craziest things that was happening at the church when I came was that every ministry had a checklist. Women's ministry, men's ministry. The high school youth ministry, the junior high youth ministry, uh, uh, children's ministry, the what we call kids helping kids Christmas gift ministry, um, and I think the benevolence. So I think we had like seven checking accounts, plus our general checking account, a savings account, and our building fund account. So we had like twelve or thirteen accounts. And each one of those ministries was funded. And, you know, they didn't get a lot of money. Like the kids' ministry got $75 a month. The women's ministry got $50 a month. You know, it was just drafted out of the general fund into all of those accounts. But there was, there was no accountability over those funds. And so Mary Ann comes in. She says, I think you need to call all those checkbooks in and close all those accounts. It all goes into one fund. It's all the church's money. They get the responsibility of handling their money, and they'll have a budget line item you talked about you know having this budget and at the end of the year if whatever was left it goes back to the church because it's the church funds. it's not it's not well we had one group that said no that's our money that's our money mike can guess which one it is 
Well, it was the Baptist win. It was. Sorry, I had the same thing in my church. I don't know. Um, so there was no accountability. She said there's no accountability on any of these accounts. We don't know where this money's going. We don't know who's writing checks. We don't know what they're writing it for. Um, you need to close them immediately. So we did. I, I just said, hey, Marianne said that, that's was my favorite term. Marianne said. We have to call, close all these accounts. They didn't like it. That women, especially, we had to make some special accommodations for them. They kept their money. At mm -hmm. the end of the year, we rolled it into a Baptist women's special account. So they got to keep their money. If, we said, if the church has the money to put it in there. If things are tight, right. we're not putting your money in. You don't get your money. Right. You know, uh, actually, it's God's money, but whatever. Um, so... So we dropped down to a general fund, a building fund, savings account, and, and greater level of accountability. Um, she, one of the first, well, well, we'll get into that. So she just said, good stewardship demands accountability. And, and you've got to close all this. So we had some serious issues, I think, going on. And she was able to identify them and rectify them very quickly. Um, so good stewardship. Involves plan spending, plan saving, plan giving. So uh, we talked about that in the personal finance. Now we're going to talk about it in the church finance. Budgeting process. I want to walk you through just the budgeting process as a church. Uh, the first principle that I've learned about the budgeting process is this. It's never easy. It's never easy. Uh, sometimes difficult decisions have to be made. Sometimes ministries or programs have to be cut. Sometimes ministries or programs will see their budget reduced. Uh, rather than increased. So it's not, not always easy. Second principle that I've learned through the years is that you need to take a realistic look at your finances, especially patterns in giving. Uh, you may not be able to do that if you're beginning a church, but established churches can do this. But as a beginning church, you need to, if you're beginning a church, you need to start tracking mm -hmm. the giving and the, so what you receive as well as what you spend. Um, and gather that information year after year, and then you grow it, you get this picture of, okay, this is kind of how things lay out. You see patterns, you see ups and downs, and it, it's amazing how, you know, there's always an anomaly. There's always a, you know, October, for whatever reason, was usually a difficult month for our church, whatever, I don't know why. We could see that, okay, probably things are going to dip down. Summers, you know, tend to slump, right? And so, we would, we would kind of be expecting those things. And then there would be an anomaly where you would have a great month in an October that you never expect. You know, God would just throw that in there. And then there's, there's this factor too. If you're in a church that is a working class mm -hmm. uh, church, then times like uh, near the holidays is when the, when the money goes down. Yep. If you're in a more of an upper class church, the money, the giving tends to go up. Because of write-offs, they will give mm -hmm. just so you get a tax for the, the tax things, and so that used, to, that used to be the case. Now, now the government's taken that away from us. Oh, they they and they've increased, increased they've increased the charitable giving that everybody can take. What do you call that? Just the uh, oh, yeah. uh, standard, deductions. standard deductions. And so you have to raise a, a lot of money, you put a lot of money to be able to get. You got to put over two twenty thousand. Hallie, Hallie Tober's woman told me that one time. She said, "Oh no." December is a great month for us, but they had a lot of yeah. upper. We, we never had those. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have that. Honestly, <laughs> those people always listen. We're borrowing from tax return month. Yeah. <laughs> for December, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So tracking expenses, I think, is the biggest thing. A lot of times our budgeting process up until about 2008 was this. Uh, we would pull, put, put the budget up. There's usually just one sheet. And we take the budget, okay, this is what we did last year, what we want to do this year, okay, we're going to raise this, raise this, raise that. There's never, let's decrease this. Yeah. There's always raise this, raise this, raise this. Sounds great. Everybody vote for it. Yeah, sounds good. Let's present it to the church. Church votes on it. And we all knew we're only going to spend what we bring in, right? Right. Yeah. And so, so it was really just like pie in the sky. I mean, it was just, didn't mean anything. So 2008, I sat down with the, and in the past, as a pastor, I always led the budgeting 
mm -hmm. uh, workshops. Mm -hmm. I just felt like that was my role to help lead that, not let someone else take. I didn't take control of it. I just let it and let's talk about these things. Here's some things I see. Here's what what the vision I have for the church and how we might need to fund some things differently. But in 2008, they wanted to, the, the, we, I can't blame them in, we wanted to, to, to present a budget that was, I don't even remember now, um, like over $200,000. We're, we're a small church. You know, 100 people was a good month. Um, so I didn't feel good about it. I was like, I have some, we, we were meeting for our final meeting. And I was like, I don't feel good about it. But I just don't think we should do this. I think people are, you know, I think people will have enough at this point. I said, we can't, this isn't right. So what I did was I prepared for that final meeting. I, I came in and said, I went back over the expenditures that I've been tracking and that I, I get, gathered as much information as I could. And I put it just in a simple spreadsheet, you know, for the <clears throat> committee. And, and I said, all right, proposed budget for 2007 was $163,509. Uh, Total income for 2007 was $124,000. So we, were, we didn't meet our budget in 2007. And we were proposing an even bigger budget for 2008. Um, our expenses, however, for 2007, so our income was 124000 Our expenses were 133000 So we actually spent more than we brought in. And then I broke that down and did the same thing for every every year. 2006, our budget was 150000 We brought in 141000 We spent 154000 uh, 2005, our budget was 133000 We brought in 164. dollars had a great year that year. Our expenses were only 150000 um, So I just broke it down all the way to 2003. That was the, the, the least, that was the, the last amounts that I had access to. And I said, okay, here, let's just trend this out. Here's about what we bring in every, you know, we can average over the five years what we bring in. We can average over the five years what we spend. Uh, we can add, you know, basically we needed to, I said, tonight we need to trim $22,000 out of this budget. And they're like, oh, well, we can't do that. I'm like, oh, we're going to have to. You know, we, right, there's no realistic. way we're bringing this kind of money in. And we know we're not going to even spend that much. Right. We don't need it. So we had a really rough meeting. When we left that room, we had our, we did. And, you know, and it looked like we were balancing the budget on the backs of our nursery workers and things like that. We, we just had way too much fluff in those, in certain accounts. We just put way too much, well, we want to give them a raise. We think it's going to cost this much and they're going to be working this many hours. And so some of the areas looked like they were taking a really, really big hit. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we we did that. Um, so 2008 budget was very different than 2007, 2006. Um, I went back and looked at 2008. Our income exceeded our expenses, so we brought in more than we spent in 2008 by $3,435. So just one year after hiring Mary Ann uh, to help with our finances, we went from you know being in the in the red by $1,400 to being in the black 34. So, um, so you got to be realistic when you start sitting down with that budget. Uh, be intentional about the process. Research, do preparation, plan everything you can for what I call budget workshops. We had about two or three budget workshops where we just sat down, really hammered out how much money we're spending here, what do we need to spend there next year. Uh, we would send out uh, budget request forms to all of our committees and say, here's what you had in your budget last year. Here's how much you spent. How much would you like to request this year? It doesn't mean you're going to get it because um, they might raise it or whatever. You know, I had a youth minister who put like $42,000, you know, and it's like, well, you know, you're not going to get that. You know, he's like, yeah, I know. You're going to get, you, you're going to get it what you have. I'm like, exactly. So don't write down $42,000. He was just kind of smart. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanted to just go buy pizza. So anyway. So we would give those out. We would receive them back. We'd say, all right, the men's ministry said, you know, they spent, they had 600 in the budget last year. They only spent 400. Um, you know, they're asking for five. You know, great. Let's give them five. You know, and we just, sometimes we were able to honor that. Sometimes we were able to not. And we'd say, no, we can't do that. Um, and children's ministry always wanted more. And, you know, that was great. Um, sometimes we could give it to them. Sometimes we couldn't. So 
I always gave those out. So it wasn't just the finance committee making these decisions. They were making the final decision, but we were inviting others to give input. Some churches, I don't know, you, you may have done it more as a leadership committee, your, your committee chair people coming together to mm -hmm. form the budget. We did a, a, a like a budget retreat mm. and we uh, went to the Ralstons. Oh, wow. Okay. And you've been to their place. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's a beautiful place. And of course, they got mad and said, why do we have to come here and focus on budget? But anyway, you just have to know the place. But <laughs> it's a gorgeous. We took them to a wonderful place. And then uh, Made myself, and, myself and my treasurer led it. Mm -hmm. We put the budget together and then let the, the church roll on. One thing I'd like to add to what Randy said was, too, when, when I went to my previous pastorate, we doubled in size the first year. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then by the, the second and third year, we had increased probably another 25%. Uh, so Randy's giving you some, some more realistic of what your average church, who's Correct. consistent, That's right. who has about, you know, when I went there, I'm an evangelist, and that was my first pastor, and mm -hmm. I went in, you know, all in, about half killed myself, but I mean, we were having a hard time because my treasurer was going, you're spending like crazy. And I'm like, but we're bringing in money like crazy. And, you know, the the third year that we were there, at the end of the year, we banked $36,000. Wow. That's awesome. We banked it. The next year after that, we banked $24,000. Uh, some people were upset because that third year I spent sixty, dollars But at the end of the year, we had 50% of that because we bought a, yep. a, a house that was yep. right next oh, door right. and turned it yeah. into a youth facility. We gained half of that back that year in profit. We banked $36,000. <laughs> so about my fifth year there, I had to put the brakes on because then we were leveling out. Mm -hmm. We had about a hundred people like you were talking about and- uh, Giving was pretty consistent. Giving was consistent. We weren't growing as much. That third year, I think we we baptized like 18 that year. They hadn't done that in the last 15 combined. You know, I mean, we really saw. So there's there's exceptions, but what he's giving you is, especially in the established church, something that's going to be, it's, it's not going to change. That's that's why he was able to look at that and say, guys, let's be realistic. We're, we're not going to bring in that kind of money, you know. <laughs> No, we didn't. We didn't have those people, you know, the, the doctors, the lawyers, and things like that. And those things we look at as a hundred people. We can't do that. We got to look. We got to break it down into family in it. Because if, if there's a hundred people that are giving one hundred sixty-six dollars a year every month, you're gonna make two hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. But those but other people have to give one hundred sixty-six. But you don't. Each one of them is not going to give. Them. No, right. that's what I'm saying. So you've got to break that yeah. down when you're looking at a budget. The family you, unit. You're going to have to look at the family units yeah. and decide how many family units have I got that are going to be tithing because you know, you know, Jimmy. Well, know. And, and that's a good, that is a good point. I, one of, I tracked all yeah. of our expenditures, uh, income. Uh, every week, my ministry assistant would give me a report and, you know, just here's how much was for general fund, here mm -hmm. was for the missions fund, for whatever we were, you know, whatever the breakdown was, whatever. The giving was I would put that into a, a database that I or a spreadsheet that I created, right. and one of in about for about five years I I did I said I want you I said I don't I want to know who gives and whatever blah 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 no. I want you to count the number of different people giving units what I call them mm -hmm. who gave this week our trip and I would to give track us a report of that you yeah. give us a report of how much money was coming and by how many families right. So we could keep an eye on where we were, so we didn't get into financial. And it made it, it makes a difference, yeah. It because did, there was no names attached to it. Correct. No you just know ten, ten people were given. Ten people. That ten week. People, yeah. Or the next you week. Just, you could just do like some churches where they bring you in. They want to see your pay stub. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there are churches that there. Yes, there are. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's one in this area. Are you talking about change to <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's well known. Well known. Yeah, that, it is. They, they deny it. I mean, I've talked to people that. No, know. I've had people tell me they go to church there. Uh, they they do it. They do I have, it. I have was, one of my soldiers. It, it friends, works for them. He got invited there because he was looking for a church, and 
he felt pretty good at first. It's, everything was good. Everybody's greeting him and everything. And then somebody comes up and says, oh, you're a staff sergeant. So you make this much money. So that means you, you can get this right. for X. Whoa. And he goes, okay. Never went back. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I would have done. It does happen. I mean, you know, know. Yeah, we're not that, we weren't that way. You know, no, I, I never no. knew who gave. I, I had an idea, you know. But you shouldn't. I mean, you'll know. The, but in the New you Testament, never know. you really never know. In the New Testament, it says, give us your heart. Yeah, we know about that. Because I just look, you know, sometimes we say we've got so many people in the church. Correct. Even some people have been members for years. Not time. No. You may not know that as a pastor. No, you don't. Staff member. So you're really thinking, well, you know, hey, they, they're both school teachers. They're making, no. you know, 70000 each month. No. They're making 150000 a year. No. They've got to give them 1500 a month. You know? <laughs> and you just sit there going, mm, you know, and then you find out they're giving you nothing. You know? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I, yeah, I tried so, to keep yeah, stay that far you're from that. Yeah. When I, we, we changed the ministry assistants uh, about halfway through my, min my ministry. One retired yeah. and then hired a lady who's one of my dear friends. And she actually works for me now in my in my office uh, also but um you know she was new to this okay. and and uh i would have to get on there i'd be like hey um don't leave the financial reports <laughs> on no, your desk no turn them over put them in a drawer i don't want to be just walking past and see oh well brother ed did yeah you know on his envelope where he wrote we've had church right here yeah Come, yeah. come and say, well, I hear you give. Uh, We're going to talk about that. 60% of the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons, That's awesome. <laughs> one of the reasons that I said what I said was is because someone like Sylvester or Bonnie, yeah. uh, you're going to be planting. And so, like what, That's right. what Randy was talking about, it is, it's difficult uh, in those first. Oh, yeah. I mean, like right now, Miss Mary Ann is. We hired Miss Marianne as well. <laughs> now she doesn't, she's retired, but she still does a few churches. Uh, but she said, we need a budget. I need a budget from you. And I was like, she goes, okay, how about if I create one for you? And I said, sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> so this year she's going to kind of, because she's been watching every day. And so she's going to put something together for us. But in the beginning of a church plant, it's very difficult because if you're, if you're growing like you should, then you know money ought to be coming in more, but you also ought to be starting ministries and you know bringing on a, maybe it would be a challenge. It's a challenge. It would be a very big challenge. It's a challenge to not have anything right. to look at. Yeah, right. And that's no the only reason that I said that is because I was very fortunate. That's good point. My second month in my previous pastorate, we had a deficit of over, uh, over forty six hundred dollars. My second month, I started in October, November's. Uh, it, uh, uh, income versus expenses, we were negative $4,600. I got that report and I was like, mm -hmm. we've got to make up $4,600. How do we do that? How do we do that? And so December, we were in the black. And I, it was, I got on my face and Correct. I said, God, do it. That's right. Whatever you can do. Was that 2007? <laughs> <laughs> it was 2011. Okay. But, uh, this is a, I don't, want it. I don't have enough for everybody. Uh, this is a copy of our, so our budget presentation went from 2008, just one sheet, to this in 2000, for many years. Uh, I want you to have, Carl can make other copies if we need to, but uh, this is one of those, Mary Ann uh, came up with this, or she presented this to me. She said, uh, you need a budget. I mean, you know, but you need more than just that sheet that you've been giving me. And she said, here's a format. I think it would work for you. You went with it. So I was done enough. And I said, well, yeah, Mary said to do it. We're going to do it. <laughs> so um, she, she told me later when she retired from uh -huh. us, she said, you were the only pastor that I ever had that actually did what I asked with this. <laughs> well, you said so. So <laughs> anyway, you know, um, it just lays out what we're doing with the money and how much money. So each each set of pages just shows the different ministry categories, how much money, and and it gives explanation. So uh, we use that from 2009. So for over 10 years, I did this, and it 
it saved us so much uh, headache because people would, they didn't have to ask, well, what, what is this fund for? I say, well, look at your budget. Mm -hmm. You know, it says right there, children's ministry, we, we provide refreshments and other supplies for our largest weekly children's outreach. Uh, on Wednesdays, funds are included this year for children's drama ministry and the annual trunk or treat. Oh, okay, well, that's what that's for. So it, uh, we just laid it out. And every, every line item in our budget had an explanation beside it. So we would present this a couple of weeks in advance. People could take it home, read it, look at it. And it really, really helped us um, a lot. And so, um, you know, we would, so I'd give it, I tried to give it about the second week of November and then the first Sunday in December or the last Sunday in November, just been on the calendar. That's when we would vote on it. Our bylaw said we had to vote on the budget after at the end of a morning worship service. Right. So I would call us to order, and the same man would say, I would say, I hear a motion that we present the report uh, from the budget committee. We didn't have any time for questions. The bylaw said no time for questions. We're just voting on it, yes or no. Uh, I'd say do I have a motion that we approve the, the budget as presented. The same man would make the motion, the same man would give a second every year, 10 years. Um, and then we would we would vote. Sometimes we vote by ballot, sometimes we vote to say amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, whatever. Uh, all those opposed, nobody ever opposed it. And they just didn't get to it. That's how they opposed it, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I would have people stand up. If you're in favor, stand and, and show that. And they would stand up. I mean, everybody stood, right? <laughs> that didn't mean they were going to get it. Um, I had an old deacon that told me that. I think I think you ought to just have everybody stand up. That just puts action to them. Like, sure, that's right. You know, it didn't, it didn't change anything. <laughs> it's still weird. But um, you know, they they still control their own checkbook. Um, you know, this format uh, we started with giving. So I, I talked about the fact that. Uh, Personal finance should start with plan giving. Church finance should start with plan giving. Too. So the first category was mission and ministry. Mm -hmm. We just laid out what we were giving to the Baptist General Convention of Texas through the property program, what we were giving to the Bell Baptist Association. Uh, we had Holland to the World Fund. That was our mission fund uh, that we used to support some people that were from our church who were doing missions which allowed others to go on short-term mission trips. We helped pay for their, their way. It also supported our uh, annual trip to China when we went to China for a couple of years in a row. Uh, it paid for the people that could go. There's only two or three that could actually make the trip. And we paid 100% uh, of their expenses to be able to go to our unreached people group. <clears throat> we gave our Texas Baptist Children's Home down around Rock. We had our own benevolence fund. We had a mission fund that funded all of some other mission opportunities that members of our church were involved in uh, overseas or helping others go overseas. Uh, Highland Lakes, got some, uh, we supported them for years and years and years. Uh, Baptist women, Baptist men, we consider that part of our mission. So, you know, we just laid it all out there. This is where we're giving as a church. You know, we ask people to give as a family and we uh, we believe the church ought to be giving too. And here's how we're doing it. And it was, you know, and I just had the calculation set up when I put in the figures that it Tallied up as 14 percent of our budget. And that, that's pretty much uh, the case uh, every year. There's never, never less than, never less than 10. Always more than, more than 12. Uh, then we went in, you know, pastoral ministry, um, student ministry, children's ministry, education outreach ministry, worship ministry, uh, the support ministry. You know, various categories through that. Um, operations ministry. I called everything a ministry because everything we did as a church, I believe, was ministry focused. Uh, whether that was paying the light bill or uh, paying the nursery work. You know, it's ministry. And so, you know, the, the best thing that, that the best thing Marianne taught me, one of the best things she ever taught me was uh, on the operations ministry under uh, number 11. It says miscellaneous. Miscellaneous. That was the key to a good Balanced budget <laughs> because there's always stuff you, it doesn't fit anywhere else. You know, I, I like, well, that for years we would have the, the piano tune, and we're like, well, we don't really have a piano tune for it. Uh, let's put, put it in this lane. What's that? I know where that goes. Music budget. Well, <laughs> now it eventually ended up there, yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know where that comes out. But, 
But for years, we just didn't ever think about it until it was time to fill in. And so we just put it in the plan. Well, when the, we got ready for our budget meeting, I always printed out what we call the account activity report for the miscellaneous. So it'd give me every dollar we put in the miscellaneous, and we would look at it as finance fee. What have we spent money on that we need to add a category to the budget? And so down tuning after two or three years, we're like, eh, let's just put that under worship ministry. Here's the worship ministry budget for the music, but then we're going to have a piano tuning budget underneath. You know, just very practical, something that we hadn't really ever thought of, but it needed to be done every year and needed to plan for it. Um, so, so this was our this was our budget. Um, it helped us track our expenses. It helped to to say this is we're doing good. So, at, at the end of the year, uh, we could you know pull every one of these categories. I could I could say, well, this is how much we budgeted, this is how much we brought, uh, this is how much we spent, uh, this is how much was left over, how much we went over, whatever it was, and, and we could just look at every line item, and that's the way we operated our, at our budget workshops, we just started at the top, and we we're like, okay, here, here, here. Uh, each committee, maybe, you know, so we would give those uh, budget request forms to the ministries, and, you know, we would allow them to, to fill in their blanks, so to speak. Uh, the mission committee they give us the percentages uh what what we what they believe we should be giving to the bell association to the cooperative baptist or to the uh, cooperative program for baptist general convention of texas what we should be giving to uh children's home those kinds of things they they were the ones they met they recommended to us we would say yeah that looks good we can do that and plug it in so um you know when you start a church it's not going to look like this right Right. It's not going to look like this, but that's the goal to get to that point where mm -hmm. every year you're right. gaining knowledge, experience, and, a, and an ability to be able to, okay, well, personnel expense, mm -hmm. operations, you know, building rent, you're going to have utilities, you're going to have potentially rent a facility, you're going to have to pay some people, um, you're going to, you know, Going to have some things you got to buy for the office for. So what was the, what was the first thing Miss Marianne made you do? For what? Before what she mean? started doing your books. You had to purchase power church, didn't you? Oh gosh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a. We had to have important. a had to have the finance. Well, if we started yeah. when she started, we had QuickBooks, and she she, she stayed with us. Oh, she did. For, with QuickBooks, but then she said mm -hmm. after those first three months, she said, "All right, if I'm going to continue." Right. QuickBooks will work. It's not great for what you're doing. Here's another option mm -hmm. called Power Church. Uh, we were we were also using my, my church ministry system was using Servant Keeper at the time, which was a database and, and all of that. And but our treasurer was using QuickBooks, right. Same and they we didn't talk. No. So she said, "You need to bring everything together." Right. That was a little hard on my. I mean, my general funky. She was an older lady. She was an older lady. She did not like changing. Right. No, we we changed. The only reason that I brought that up is because that's good. Especially those of you who are going to plant a church, it's good to start with a good software. It's right. made for churches. That's right. And the reason for that is because as soon as you can get to the point to hire somebody like Marianne, the better, and she'll be able to come right in and just take over without having to. Do like both of our yeah when my previous pastor it was it was the same thing it was quickbooks and servant keeper and they aren't compatible so one controls your your ministry assistant puts in the giving the church membership the role and all right. that but quickbooks is where all your bills get paid and all the finances and they don't interchange so there's a lot of double work uh, but the only reason i said that was because like uh, she did we switched over to Marianne at my previous pastor, and as soon as we came to this church, I honestly had people say, you're going to start paying somebody from the very beginning? Are you going to have the money? Yes. I said, it's worth it. It's worth it. It is worth it to automatically start with someone on the outside who has no vested interest either way. They're going to keep you right with the IRS. They're going to keep you with your church. What did he say? He would go back and say, Marianne said, yeah. they were like, well, how do you argue with Person who knows money. Yeah. It's, too yeah. easy, it's too easy to look at your secretary and say, We don't have enough money for the taxes. Correct. 
You really get to make that step done in church. Yes. I've been in meeting, I've been in meeting with the pastor and the secretary and the treasurer and the exact thing right across the table. We're going to plan to make taxes. Are you talking about payroll taxes? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Because mm -hmm. church doesn't pay taxes. Yeah, no, they, 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 they right. just, mm -hmm. well, anyway, that's, that's that gets good. you in trouble. That gets you in trouble. <laughs> <control. laughs> uh, we, we were in that. That's exactly. where we were. I know. I did. That's what I'm saying. So sometimes it's really better to have somebody on the outside. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and that's one of the. Do it. Fair enough, right? That's one of the things that I mean. That, that's why I say that was the single mm -hmm. best decision because she saved us so many times. Where, where literally I could say, Marianne, I would call her and I'd say, Marianne, the answer is no. So what? I said, I'm fixing to ask you a question, and you're going to tell me no. Okay. I lay it out there, and she said, no. Nope. <laughs> I said, all right. What I needed? Go back to the meeting. Mary Sorry, no. Marianne said no. So and it was true. She did. She said no. And they would not argue. No. But if I said no, yeah. well, that's kind of like using the same thing, right? It kind of is. Kind of is. And she and she was totally fine with that. She loved being that person. She's like, if ever you need me. To come to a meeting and tell them no, no. I'll do it. <laughs> she was. She, she would come in there and she'd say, yeah, "Listen, she retired, huh? this is just the way it is, and you can't do it." Or uh, well, she would say, "She would say, like that. she would say, I, you can't do it this way, as long as I'm your treasurer." Right, right, right. If you don't want me to, I mean, right. and she, she and she, no hard feelings. I'll walk out the door tomorrow. Yeah. You know? And she, she did on. Mm -hmm. She did on the church. She, oh, yeah. she oh, yeah. said, I don't agree. Pastor was doing something that she didn't agree with, didn't think it was right. This is not the way to handle it. And she said, I, I will not be your treasurer anymore. And left. And I'm like, whoa, I don't, whatever you say, Marianne, I want you to say, you know, because our finances just flourished. Not because she was doing anything magical, it's just because she kept us accountable. Yeah. So yeah, that's the program. Some good church-based program, excellent. A, a a trained bookkeeper, definitely. Accounting committee, someone that you can trust to count those funds. Pastor should not be doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Even in a small church, even in a start church, start pastor should not do it. Like I said, when I got there, there was two ladies who met every month. They were related to one another. They never could count the money correctly. There was always a problem. Um, we eventually, well, I was told before I got there, they actually had two couples, a man and wife, two, two men and wives that would take turns taking the money home at the end of the service mm -hmm. and counting. Mm -hmm. We have like, similar issues. Our, what? Our you're, you're taking the, the money home? Nobody knows how much was in there? And bringing it back and saying, this is how much there is? Okay. So they had already stopped doing that. But when I got there, had these two ladies that they were related, wonderful people. I'm not, there's no, nothing wrong with them. They did the best they could. We eventually modified to having a committee of three and they kind of rotated and they were not related. Um, we then modified to a committee of six and two people met each time, each month. They took turns, months. Oh gosh, we had two people that they didn't have any business doing accounting and they mess up everything every month. And that's but not a moral do. issue, but it's an ethical it is. practice. But you and you have to choose people on your county committee that you can trust not to tell who who's is giving right. what, or even more importantly, who is not giving you. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. like you said, there yeah. are people you think are giving, yeah. and they're not giving anything. Yeah. They might be deacons, but they probably are, actually. Okay. Uh, you know. I just had some that I was like, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be. And then, and then you're also making an assumption because yeah. the, the cash, because you don't you don't know who put cash in. You don't. No, you, you don't. don't. Yeah. You yeah. don't. I, I had a youth minister and I said, hey, your record shows you've not given the thing. I wanted to know if a staff member would give it. Right. We made I said, I, and, right. You're correct. Yeah. And I said, you, you're, you haven't given a dime this year. He said, I get you. I said, well, then you need to put it in an envelope, put your That's name right. on it. That's right. So we can track it. I said, because the church, need, you know, if anybody is getting it, it's to be a minister. 
And so you should be giving. I'm not, I'm not asking how much you're making. I'm not asking right. how much you're giving. I'm just saying you need to be giving something. We did the same thing. And he was just a young kid. And he's like, got it. And I mean, you know, I never checked his record again. I don't know if he did it or not. <clears throat> so when I was a youth pastor, I gave cash, but I gave. Sure. When I cashed but, or put my check in the bank, I went through my tithe and I put it, but I put it in an envelope in my name. With your name on it. Yeah. 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 You did. I mean, you know, and he right. just didn't know to right. do that. And I never. Um, so having some. What's that? Sorry. What's that? <laughs> so Vester says that's what he started doing. I said, I know. I'm the one who got after you to stop doing it. <laughs> But your name. Yeah. Just, this is my wife. <laughs> my wife and I keep a checkbook, and we use we write one check every month. And there is an occasion when we'll have to write a check for something else, but we primarily have a checkbook mm -hmm. because I have been in churches where Correct. other, like the treasurer, came to me and said that minister is not giving, and that treasurer looked at me and said. You're giving because I know how much you make, and I get your check every month. I mean, right. they, they so they'll call you out. That's right. Yeah. You're a, you need to be setting an example. Correct. And so does your staff. That's right. And so I had a treasurer come to me, and I had to sit down and talk with the lady, and she wasn't giving. She said, "I give to my my church that I grew up in," <laughs> and I was like, "So she didn't lie." She told us, I do give 10% to the church, but just not our church. Right? <laughs> so that didn't fly too well with our treasurer. And he was a tight one. And so, they, you know, after that, we put in on the job description. That's right. For whatever job description you were, minister of music, whatever, that in your job description, it said that you will be faithful to give back to the ministry of the church. Right? So that's, what, that's why he was holding them accountable. So, no. I think the minister needs to be involved, you know, not knowing what everybody gives, but just being engaged, you know, what's what what where the money's going, being involved in the budgeting aspect of it. I, I found that to be, you know, uh, looking over those financial reports. Marianne brought me those reports every month. I would look over them. Great thing about Power Church, we went to the cloud-based version of that. I could yep. access portions of the and print those reports for myself each week if I wanted or each month or whatever. She always brought them at the end of the month, but sometimes I wanted to know before then. Uh, now, there was a time in my life where I got really stressed out about church finances, and, and I was checking those reports every month, every twice, you know, twice a week, and, I mean, you know, just really stressed out about, you know, the money coming in was not, you know, making budget, and, and I just got, you know, slept, sleepless nights, worried about what we're going to do, and if we don't get the money in and what, what's going to happen and you know all of this stuff and these people and what they're going to think and all that lost a lot of sleep over it finally one day i, I and marianne knew she knew she's like you're so stressed out about this i'm like i know i just really it's just eating me up and finally one day the lord just got a hold of me and i said god you know what this is your church they're your people they're going to give what you leave them to give or or, or they're going to choose to be disobedient whatever it is i mean i, I can't say one way or the other and I just, I'm going to it, give it back to you. You know, you just take control of it. You know what we need. You know what the people can give or what they're going to give. And I just turn, I just turn it loose. And I never had another sleepless night over it. And Mary Ann said, gosh, you're, you're different. Because she would come in with those reports. She's like, hey, you probably already looked at them. I'm like, no, I haven't looked at them yet. Let's look at them together. What? You hadn't looked at them? I'm like, no, I've given it up. I'm tired of, you know, developing an ulcer over this whole deal. And, and me worrying about it wasn't changing one bit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, yes, be involved, be engaged in it, but don't let it just consume you. So, plan giving or plan, plan spending, you got to plan your spending. A plan saving, I think, from the beginning of planning a church, I think you need to be saving some money. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we did as a church, I, I just felt good about. This is me as a manager coming in and saying, "Okay, here's here's some ways that we can make what we're doing better." That's what a manager does. Looks at the way things are going. How can we improve? Uh, one of the things that we did as a church was, you know, we had property insurance, we had uh, automobile insurance, we had uh, umbrella policy insurance. Um, when we were building a building, we had um, well, builders risk insurance and we had a lot of insurance 
And we were just paying that by month, you know, uh, or by quarter, really. Actually, we're paying it by quarter. We had to pay a little fee to pay it by quarter. Uh, and in every time one of those payments came due, it was tough on our budget. March, uh, June, uh, you know, September, whatever it was. Those were real hard months because it was a big amount. And I said, you know, I really want to get to the point where we have the money at the end of the year saved up to where we can pay for right. the insurance for the full year and not to worry about it. So we started. We said, all right, let's. So one year at the budget, I brought that up to the budget uh, team and I said, let's, what, what can we do? And they said, well, let's just start putting $200 a month into an insurance savings account. So we did $200 a month. That wasn't enough. That wasn't near no, what was going to be at, you know, in the month. In the year, we're going to have $2,400. Our bill was over $7,000 at the time. And I was like, well, that, you know, so it's going to take us three or four years to get to enough in that savings account to be able to pay for it. But that's fine. You know, we're, we're getting, we're, we're moving toward it. Uh, then we had some really good months, and, and we were able to, uh, at the end of the year, move a big chunk of money into there. And, and so within a year, we were able to save up for the next year. And that was the biggest blessing for our church because, you know, we had it paid for that whole year. Then the next year, every month, we took out exactly how much. That's how we And we knew. So our budget was then a little more balanced. Okay, we know our expenses are going to be this month. Instead of waiting for that third month where it was a big hit. Yeah. We had it every month. So that, and so we put it aside. For the year, we had enough. So. That was just a, a wonderful blessing. We also started what we call the, what I call the tomorrow fund. Um, and uh, the tomorrow fund was uh, just, we had a goal of $40,000 to, to have in a savings account. And that was in case the building, major problem in the building. Um, and that's always gonna be one of your biggest expenses if you have a building. Yeah, maintain, maintaining that building, maintaining those air conditioning units, maintaining the plumbing, whatever it is, but have a certain amount of money. Or if it wasn't a building issue, if we had just a disaster, okay, let's say a pandemic. I don't know. Uh, that, may not, that, may, that may never happen. Right. But uh, <laughs> if, if we have this worldwide pandemic and people can't go to work and they can't come to church and they don't get it, how do we pay our people? How do we keep the lights on? How do we? So we had this one, and I don't know if they used it during the pandemic. I wasn't there, uh, but they had it in place. Right. And so, you know, I thought again, we just started putting some money aside. I said it's going to take us four or five, six years to get to forty thousand dollars. One year, uh, one of our members uh, gifted ten thousand dollars. You know, just to to that fund. And I'm like, whoa, you know, didn't, didn't expect that. Right. And so within with some good years, and then that great gift within a couple of years, we had that. That threshold, and we yeah we had to use it. We dipped into it a couple of times for major building problems, uh, but then we would just pay for that. Just pay for that. And one thing that Randy is talking about that a lot of church members may not understand. Uh, he was just talking about insurance. Ours was by the time I left my previous pastor at almost fourteen grand a month. I mean a year. Yeah. So we're talking. We had to have a thousand dollars a month come yeah. in just, just for, for insurance. insurance. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's not counting your utility, right. your uh, pastor, I mean, uh, you name it, toilet paper, yeah. office supplies. <laughs> People don't realize that, I mean, you've already got several thousand dollars a month just to be there. That yeah. That's not even paying your pastor. Nope. That's not paying. Nope. So. Uh, educating your people on where the money goes is a very good thing. And another thing too is if you do start a church in your home, if you're looking to increase your home insurance too, because some home policies will not cover right. church members if they get injured at your home. Yeah, I was, you can get sued. We were we were fortunate you're right. because we started our church in my house, yeah. seven people in my living room. Our house is zoned commercial residential. Mm. So that's a little bit different. different. Yeah. yeah. So Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> that, that, those are, that that idea. There are just certain costs yes. that oh, you yeah. just have to already be aware of. Uh, our building, I mean, it was a big blessing. We built it debt free, um, but you know, we went from a we went from several buildings that were about seven thousand square feet all combined to a, a one building that was twenty five thousand square feet. We went from. Uh, 
five air conditioning units. Mm. It's a 50 air conditioning. You know, and if you know anything about air conditioning units, mm -hmm. they break down mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so maintenance costs, that, that's where that tomorrow fund yes. came in real handy for us uh, uh, so many times. So plan saving, you just got to plan for saving. That, that's good stewardship. Plan spending, planning what, what you're bringing in, how you're going to spend it, being good stewards of that. Plan savings, saving a portion of that. Because, you know, how many times in God's word does it talk about with the being savers, being planning for the future? Uh, you know, Proverbs and, and even in, into the New Testament talk about, you know, being prepared for what, what's coming ahead. Um, Murphy's Law, right? You know, if anything can go wrong, it will. Um, and having that savings account oftentimes repels Murphy, you know? I mean, back to Dave Ramsey's plan, saving that initial $1,000, uh, but then once you get past get out of debt, then he says, you know, you need to save for three to six months living expenses in case you lose your job, you, you lose your health, whatever it is, and you can't work. And, you know, we, we, we have that saved up in our own family. And, you know, there have been times where we had to, to dip into it. I mean, a few a few years ago, our, we were going to a family reunion where, and our van just, just died on the side of the road mm. and had needed a new engine. I mean, you know, had to put, we just lost the oil pressure. Bit. And you know, oil is kind of important. And so we we were like, we, we took it to the dealership, and and they, you know, I said, seems like it's a problem. You know, so Honda should be, do better than this. It's only about five years old, six years old. And they're like, well, you know, I haven't been serviced by us all these years. Sorry, you know, you're out of luck. It's okay. And then they were like, we said we want to put a new engine. Oh, like, what? We've got these new ones over here. Let's tell you, when we can't afford those. We got to fix the one that we are driving, you know, that we need to drive. And they just were blown away that we wanted to fix that. That's the only choice we got. It's going to be a lot of money. You didn't want to throw it away. I, I said, I can't, I can't help it. It's going to be less than buying a new one, you know. Randy has a hard time getting rid of old vehicles. I do. You drive, 1988 Toyota pickup. Belonging to my dad. I love it. It's only got 200,000 miles on it. And it doesn't need a chip. It's just, it's just broken, and you know, and you have to know how to you know, what that third pedal does. But um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where's it go? I, yeah, that's why I said if, if everything else stops right. working because they don't have a chip, I've got a vehicle. So we'll, we'll get I got one of those. <laughs> so uh, I do have hard times getting rid of a vehicle. That's true. Um, but my wife is a teacher, and she's talking about it with her friends, and they're like, "Oh gosh, we have to go get a loan." And they're like, you're, you're already paying on the car, right? And they're like, no, we, we own the car. Well, you had to get a loan to get a new engine. No, we had that money set up. Oh, we would be paying on the car and have to get a loan to repair the car. Mm -hmm. They were just, you know, it's just like, so plan saving, plan giving, uh, planning for those emergencies. Because it's going to happen personally. It's going to happen as a church. Right? Mm -hmm. Definitely going to happen. Whether you're a small congregation, a big congregation, new church, Established church, you're going to have emergencies arise. And the last thing is just that plan giving aspect. You know, we talked, I went through real quickly about our missions giving, just making sure that the church is giving and is seen as being a giving church. Um, I don't think you can challenge your people to give um, as a church if the church isn't giving. Now, I know other pastors who disagree with that. And they say, well, Really, that's double dipping. You know, uh, we should just give an offering to those people. The people give to that, and the church just keeps you know, all the money for itself. I don't, I don't, I don't like that thought. Um, you know, cutting missions because of that. Well, uh, we already, we already, you know, people already give. There's some people who are already supporting that missionary out there. The church doesn't need to support that missionary <laughs> because it's double dipping. I'm like. I don't see it that way. So the other the other reason too is when you give to the cooperative program or you give to your local association. Yeah. Right. That's why this exists. Correct. Yeah. You can do more than oh yeah. But that's why this room is right. here. That's why we have this class. So the equipment. I mean, you know, I know you didn't purchase it right. given, but just the facility itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I never I never once thought ah, we ought to just cut our gift as a church. If, if things were tight, that was not where I went. I, I'd rather take a pay cut. 
and and then then to right. to cut the gift because it was just that important that we be getting. The only thing you can't cut is the AC. Correct. Yeah, I don't want to cut that. Don't want to cut <laughs> that. They come in the funeral thing. You, you can open the window. <laughs> can they don't like it? They don't like it. Well, there are some people who would rather turn the air conditioner off because right. they're too cold. <laughs> you know, you know, then, then you have those people that are too hot. Right. So, yeah. Uh, any questions? Uh, that, that's all. Turn on the AC, bring in that smell blanket. You'll be fine. Well, uh, <laughs> our shorts that we attend that Taylor Valley. There are some Sundays I'm freezing. It's got to be cold for that. So yeah. that's because we're expecting a thousand people to show. We go to the early service where there's not that many, but then they they are preparing yeah, the auditorium for the next service where there are a lot more. Yes. That's exactly right. It's like yep. man. The, the only thing that I would say to add is this: uh, in, in my previous pastor, I had a, a a minister who lived out there, and when he was late. For church, he had to drive 25 minutes to the temple to go to church. He would drop in our church. Interesting. Well, he began to become a regular. And so I went and talked to him because I knew he was a minister in one of our sister churches. And I said, why have you not been going? And he said, well, we get up late. We just slip in here. I said, brother, you've been coming two, three times a month. You know? <laughs> you know, like, well, right. here, well, I said, the, the problem I have with that is you're a minister and you either need to get back to your church and serve or you're not sitting on my pew because you're a minister. I'm going to have you doing something. Like, yeah, but this sure. is, uh, he ended up coming about, it might have been six or eight weeks later. And he said, my wife and I are going to walk the aisle and go to church. Hmm. And I was like, are you did you pray about that because he, he was a minister in a sister church right now and he said the day that you said financial report because we did our business meetings quarterly but once a month we put a financial report in the foyer you for every everybody could at, take right? it that's right he said i went out there and looked at it and i saw where every dollar in this church goes he said i've been a minister in my church 15 years and i've never seen where it's yeah. not really. Ooh. Never saw where a dime went. And he said, when I looked at that financial support, I showed it to my wife and she said, I want it. It's closer. We keep getting that late anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but they, when people know where their we money goes, now. they're more apt to give. Yeah, right. I think that's right. That's yeah. true. I, think that's exactly I mean, I, this is a minister who actually prayed with his wife and left their church all over the fact that they never once saw where a dollar went in their church and they saw where every dollar went in that church correct so i think that's there's important. nothing to hide mm, there's nothing to hide it's their i mean it's not their money it's their giving right once they give it it's god's money yeah but but when they give to something and then they see the results and they're pleased with it they'll keep giving mm -hmm. so that, that's just something that we have, we have stuck in my mind that's good the pastor was Decided to go to mission field. And so we to go to mission field. Well, the next Sunday, we had more money in, more money come in than we had in ten years of been there. It just rolled in from places, and everybody's like, "Where did all this money come from?" And the people said, "We've been saving." Oh man, they've not been paying this time they, because wow. they would pay, you know, they'd give money to the secretary to pay for you know children's activities and stuff like that but they would pay the tithe general tithe to hide that money that they had been saving and it was waiting for him to <laughs> they were actually designating it to go yes. to sales and stuff yeah it should be yeah. Yeah. Just stay open just that was that the church. Church. yes yeah. but yeah. They, they didn't pay the when that poor guy walked out the door and then all that money just showed up it was like i was just sitting out of the roll i was just that's crazy out. And I mean, those people went to work after that. We started with doing the church, we were painting it. They went crazy. We went nuts there for a while, then we finally got a new pastor. But, uh, and they stopped you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not all over again, no. But uh, <laughs> somehow pastor, no, no. <laughs> Secretary staff, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. They, they were trying to become this way. <laughs> but it was, just, it was just something that how the people. <laughs> They've been through heartbreak or breakthrough. They've broken up with several pastors. That's so they right. didn't want to do the team. Wow. They did not want to go through the heartbreak. It's for the church twice. First one was a divorce. Uh, that happened with the secretary and the pastor. Were 